show is the case of the Liverpool Poisoner, the dramatic murder trial of Florence Maybrick, accused of poisoning her husband James in 1889. A woman is accused of poisoning her husband, but investigations reveal serious reasons for doubt. Starring Sean Baker, Tony G. Barry, Terence Edmund, Michael Cochran, Stephen Thorne, Gavin Muir, and Vincent Brimble. John Mortimer presents Sensational British Trials, a series of special investigations of true crimes and trials which scandalised the nation. Today's story, The Case of the Liverpool Poisoner. Introduced by John Mortimer. There is always a strange attraction in poisoning cases, different from that which belongs to other investigations of murder. So wrote the Times on the morning after the verdict in the case of Mrs. Florence Maybrick. James Maybrick's work as a cotton dealer often took him to America. It was there in 1881 that he met Florence Elizabeth Chandler, the 17-year-old daughter of an Alabama banker. Maybrick was then 41, but he proposed to Florence and she became his wife. The couple settled in Liverpool and had two children, a boy and a girl. Sometime around 1886, they moved to Battle Creek House, Egg Berth. On the 11th of May, 1889, James Maybrick died in mysterious circumstances. Those who'd been looking after James during his last illness became suspicious. A post-mortem was held, and soon after, Mrs Maybrick was charged with her husband's murder. On the 31st of July, the case of Regina versus Maybrick began at Liverpool Assizes before Mr Justice Stephen. Florence Elizabeth Maybrick, you were indicted for the willful murder of James Maybrick. How do you plead? Not guilty. The case for the prosecution was conducted by Mr. John Addison, QC. His first witness, Mary Cadwallader, was one of the maids Mr. at Battle Creek House. How would you describe your master's health prior to his last illness? Well, sir, he always seemed a perfectly healthy gentleman until that last illness took a hold. Miss Cadwallader, do you remember the events of Friday the 29th of March, the day of the Grand National? I do, sir. I heard raised voices coming from outside in the hall. How dare you, Florrie? No! You must take me for a fool! No, no, please! Thanks to you, I shall be the laughing stock of all Liverpool. No! Yes! Oh, but Briarly, of all people. That'll give them something to chew on. Mrs. James Maybrick seen being friendly with one of her husband's business rivals. He only asked me to take a walk along the race course. There was no harm in it. No harm in it, eh? After everything I've done for you, you make a public fool out of me. Everything you've done for me. If only you thought to include a little love. You ungrateful witch. As if I hadn't already gone through enough. Having the humiliation of finding half the traders in Liverpool know that my wife's run up a string of debts as long as my arm. I'm sorry about the money, James. Sorry? You've used me, Florrie. Then I'll leave. And do! But if you once cross that threshold, you'll never enter this house again. Do I make myself clear? I really thought the missus was going to go, sir. But then, all of a sudden, like, she changed her mind. Closed the door and without saying another word, went upstairs. I heard later that Alice Yap, the children's nurse, made up a bed for her in another room. Dr Hopper, the family physician, was the next witness for the Crown. Are you Arthur Richard Hopper, a physician and surgeon in Liverpool? I am. How long did you know the deceased? I knew Mr Maybrick and his wife for the past eight years. And how would you describe the deceased's health prior to his final illness? James Maybrick was an average, reasonably healthy man, although he sometimes complained of dyspepsia. Did you prescribe anything for that condition? Yes, I prescribed various nerve tonics. Did you ever prescribe arsenic? No. Did you receive a visit from the prisoner on, um, let me see, the 30th of March this year? Yes, I did, and Mrs. Maybrick was clearly very distressed. I was in my consulting room when she arrived at the house. 
Arthur, Arthur, you have to help me. Oh, good heavens, Flurry, what is the matter? James is very angry with me. And Arthur, I am so scared of what he might do to me. Well, what's he angry about? I'm afraid I've run up rather a lot of debts. I hardly know how my affairs got in such a mess. I so, mean, I do... So this is just about money, is it? No, no, it's much worse than that. Yesterday we went to the Grand National. And while we were there, we had a, a disagreement. I met someone, someone I know, a gentleman. We spoke a while, took a walk... James flew into a terrible rage. Does James have any cause to be jealous of this man? Of course not. Are you sure? Oh, Arthur. I have been very foolish. This gentleman lives in Liverpool. He's another cotton merchant. James knows him. Though he doesn't know how uh, close we have become. How I mean... close, Glory? Were... Lovers? Yes. Does James know the nature of your relationship with this man? No. And you won't tell him, will you? Please say you won't tell him. Well, it's not a doctor's business to tell tales. But what about the future? Are you going to give this man up? I can't. I love him. And so what about James? Are you leaving him? I wish I could. I don't believe he loves me anymore. He's often so unkind to me. I really wish I could leave, but I can't. I mean, the children. Unless that... Unless what? James said he was going to consult a solicitor about a separation. But I love the children, and I wouldn't... couldn't do anything that might hurt them. Arthur, please speak to him. On my behalf. Help us patch things up. If you do that, then I swear I'll stop seeing my friend. Very I promise. well. Very well. I'll take you home and try the application of a little oil on troubled water. <gasps> Come along. Dr. Hopper, what happened when you returned to Battle Creek's house with the prisoner? Well, both of them made various complaints against one another, but eventually, it seemed to me, some measure of reconciliation was reached. Thank you, Dr. Hopper. <laughs> Dr. Hopper... How often did the deceased consult you? I saw him frequently between June and December last year, 15 or more times. Uh, what were his complaints? They were generally the same, connected with the liver, digestive organs and nerves. He attached what I considered undue importance to these symptoms. What do you mean by that, Doctor? I mean quite simply that James Maybrick was something of a hypochondriac. You told my learned friend that you never prescribed arsenic for the deceased. That is correct. I did prescribe a tonic, which contained a solution of strychnine, but not arsenic. However, James told me, oh, some six or seven years ago now, that he had taken arsenic, and he certainly seemed to know all about its various properties, including those as, uh, well, as an aphrodisiac. Counsel for the prosecution then re-examined Dr. Hopper. Doctor, I have only two questions. At the time of the 15 or so visits which you say the deceased made to you last year, did he ever mention arsenic as one of the things he had been taking? At that time, no. And did you attend the deceased during his last, and as it turned out, fatal illness? No. No, I did not. I am Matilda Briggs, and I worked as a between maid at the home of the deceased. Miss Briggs, did you see anything take place which seemed to you to be unusual or curious? Yes, sir, I did. I come across a sponge basin on the washstand in the dressing room. The basin was covered with two towels, and as I didn't know why it should have been left like that, sir, I removed the towel so as to see what was in it. And what did you find? Well, you see, the basin was covered with a plate, and when I picked that up, I found some flypapers soaking in water. Flypapers are normally hung up in order to kill flies. Are you aware how that is achieved? Yes, sir. I think they've got poison in them. Yes, I think they have. To be precise, arsenic. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> now, Miss Briggs, are you aware that ladies sometimes make a mild arsenic solution by this method, either for cleaning stains from silk or for the treating of minor skin complaints? No, not myself, sir, but Cook said she'd heard of flypapers being used like that. Tell the court, Miss Briggs, 
Was any attempt made to hide the basin containing the flypapers? Oh, no, sir. So anyone entering the dressing room might easily have seen the basin and, uh, out of the same natural curiosity which motivated you, lifted the towels and seen the flypapers? Well, yes, sir. To prove that his wife had access to arsenic, even if it were only in the form of flypapers, the prosecution called a succession of witnesses. Two chemists who had sold flypapers to Mrs. Maybrick, an errand boy who had delivered them to Battle Crease House, and the servant who had taken them and put them on the hall table. Incidentally, she didn't recall the house being troubled by flies. The prosecution next had to show that Mrs. Maybrick also had the means and the opportunity of administering the poison. Their next witness was the Maybrick's cook, Elizabeth Humphreys. Mrs. Humphreys, how would you describe the deceased's eating habits? Um, a, a very hearty eater, sir. A, at least till he became poorly. Then he couldn't hardly eat or drink a thing without vomiting. He took a tonic, Valentine's meat juice, sometimes a little bread and milk or some arrowroot, but he seldom ate solid food. And as cook, Mrs. Humphreys, did you prepare and serve the deceased's meals? Well, sir, I prepared the meals for the most part, but Mrs. Maybrick always gave them to the master, along with all his medication. She was most particular about this. The prosecution next called one of the two doctors who'd attended James Maybrick in his final days. One of them, Dr. Henry Richards, had an interesting story to tell. I was called to see the deceased at the end of April. I found him in bed, and his wife remained in the room during my examination. I'm so worried, Doctor. Sometimes lately, I don't seem to know where I am or what's happening to me. I'll prescribe something that will help. You should know, Doctor, I have read a lot about medicines. That is an understatement. <laughs> I see. A regular home pharmacist, are you? My friends say I'm a hypochondriac. That's certainly true. But I am not. I know how I feel. Well, we'll try some new medication and see how you get along. Almost everything I take disagrees with me. You always say the same thing of everybody's medicine after you've taken it two or three days. Well, I'll send something round and come in and see you again in the morning. Very well, Doctor. As I was about to leave the house, Mrs. Maybrick asked to speak with me alone. Doctor, what James told you upstairs, well, it wasn't the whole truth. Oh? He is not only taking the medicines that have been prescribed for him, he is also drugging himself. What with? I don't know, sort of white powder. I think it might be strychnine. I see. That's very foolish and, and really quite dangerous. If he were to take an overdose, you mean? Oh, yes. If he were to take a large enough dose, then he could die. <gasps> Oh, dear God, I am to be blamed for this. For what? For Mr. Maybrick's illness, for not getting more nurses and doctors. But you've nursed him yourself, sitting up day and night for days on end, hardly having so much as a wink of sleep. You're tired and overwrought. You need to get some sleep, or you won't be in any condition to care for James. Dr. Richards, did you ever say that nothing was to be given to the deceased, food or medicine, by anyone other than the prisoner? No, I did not. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Richards, uh, when the prisoner told you that she would be blamed, uh, did you ask her who she thought would blame her? I did. And she said, I will be blamed by my brother-in-law, Mr. Michael Maybrick. Did she indicate why she thought the deceased brother should blame her? Yes. She said, he's never liked me ever since my marriage to Mr. James. I am Michael Maybrick a musical composer living in London and brother of the deceased. Mr. Maybrick, you visited your brother at his Liverpool home. Why did you decide to make this visit? I came as a result of a telegraph which I received from one of my brother's neighbours who was privy to his affairs. Perhaps you will tell the court the contents of that telegraph. It read, come at once, strange things going on here. And in what condition did you find your brother? I was shocked to find him in bed and semi-conscious. Oh, Flory? Oh, Flory! Flory! I have to say, Flory, I am most concerned about James's condition. James is receiving the finest medical attention. A nurse day and night and two of the best doctors in the city calling daily. Oh, yes. That may be how things are now. But 
Why didn't you call him professional nurses and a consulting physician before this? To begin with, the doctor said it was just dyspepsia. He certainly didn't think it was serious, so I nursed James myself. And I must say, I don't know of anyone with a better right to attend a man than his own wife. We are disturbing, James. Very well. But I tell you, Flory, I am not satisfied with what's going on here. Mr. Maybrick, did you do anything further about your suspicions? Yes. On Friday the 10th, I removed a half bottle of brandy and a bottle of Valentine's meat extract that was a little more than half full. And what did you do with them? I gave them to my brother's doctor when he called in the afternoon. What prompted you to take this action? Something which I saw on entering my brother's bedroom. The prisoner, Mrs. Maybrick, had her back to me at the time. Flory, what are you doing? Michael, you made me start. Well, what's the meaning of this? Tampering with James's medicine. Tampering? What are you talking about? I saw you from the door, pouring it from one bottle to another. There was so much sediment in this small bottle, it was impossible to dissolve it. So I was putting it in a larger one so as to shake it up better. That's all. You will not give James any more of that medicine. But, Michael, he needs... He doesn't it. need what you're giving him. I'll have the prescription made up afresh. And what's more, I'll not have you giving him anything else whatsoever. Not so much as a drop of water. Mr. Maybrick, did your brother's condition undergo any further change? Yes. His condition continued to worsen. He died at about 8.40 that evening. Sometime around 11 o'clock that night, one of the domestics brought me a chocolate box containing several bottles and a small parcel with a label on which was printed poison. And on the other side, arsenic poison for cats. What did you do with these items? I gave them to the police. Thank you, Mr. Maybrick. <clears throat> Mr. Maybrick, let us consider the bottle of brandy. Are you aware what happened to it after you gave it to the doctor? I understand it was tested. And? That it was found to be harmless. In other words, it did not contain any poison. That is so. And the medicine which you saw Mrs. Maybrick transferring from one bottle to another, so as to be able to more easily shake the contents, are you aware that this medicine was also analyzed, but that no arsenic was found in it? Yes. Yes. And the box? The chocolate box, which you referred to, containing various bottles and a parcel marked arsenic poison for cats. Are you aware that there was no arsenic in the bottles and that the parcel contained insect powder, but no arsenic? So I understand. Very well. Mr. Maybrick, were you aware that your brother was dosing himself with various medications, including arsenic? I was not. Didn't Mrs. Maybrick write to you in March of this year telling you that she had found some white powder which she believed her husband was taking and suggesting that it might be the cause of the headaches from which he suffered? Yes. Y yes, I believe she may have done. Do you still have that letter? No. I destroyed it soon after receiving it. But you recollect its contents? They were along the lines which you just described, ending with a request that I should not mention this matter to her husband. Did you respect to that request? I told my brother that someone, I did not say who, had told me that he was taking various preparations. How did he react? He said that whoever had told me that had lied. No further questions, my lord. Do you wish to re-examine this witness, Mr. Addison? My lord, uh, Mr. Maybrick, with regard to the bottle of meat juice which you also had removed from your brother's sick room, are you aware that that was also tested? Yes. I understand that it was found to contain some arsenic. Indeed. Uh, my lord, the quantity of arsenic found in this bottle was in the region of half a grain. I am Alice Yap, and I was nurse to Mr. Maybrick's children. Miss Yap, I would ask you to cast your mind back to the events of the 8th of May. Did Mrs. Maybrick ask you to run an errand for her? Yes. She asked me to post the letter. I was taking one of the children for a walk, so I allowed her to carry the letter. It was a showery day and the child dropped the letter in the wet and dirt. I picked it up, but it was all muddied and stained. So I went into the post office and got a clean envelope for it. I opened the envelope in order to transfer the letter and couldn't help but read the opening words. When I read the contents, I did not post it, but gave it to Mr. Maybrick's brother. The letter is produced in evidence. If my lord will permit, I will read its contents. Thank you, Mr. Addison. <clears throat> Wednesday. 
Dearest, I did not, I did expect, not expect to hear, to hear from, from you, you so, so soon. soon. I cannot answer your letter fully today, my darling, but you can stop worrying about our love being discovered now or in the future. M has been delirious since Sunday, and I know now that despite our meeting at the races, he is perfectly ignorant of everything between us. So there is no need for you to consider going abroad, dearest. And in any case, please don't leave England until I've seen you once again. Excuse this scrawl, my own darling. But I dare not leave the room for a moment, and I do not know when I shall be able to write to you again. In haste, yours ever, Flory. The prosecution next called Dr. William Castle, the second doctor who attended James Maybrick during his final days. He gave a detailed account of the post-mortem and said without any doubt whatsoever he had reached the conclusion that James Maybrick died of arsenical poisoning. However, under cross-examination, Dr. Castle's testimony proved more helpful to the defense than the prosecution. Dr. Castle, you told my learned friend that you have had considerable experience of cases of overdosing by arsenic taken medicinally. Yes, that is correct. And have you ever assisted at a post-mortem of a person supposedly killed by arsenic? No, 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 I have not. Oh, when you testified that you can now say, without any doubt whatever, that James Maybrick died of arsenical poisoning, does that mean that that has not always been your view? Well, I... Um... Well, perhaps I can assist your memory, Doctor. Um, at the coroner's inquest into the death of James Maybrick, did you not say, the idea of an irritant poison did not occur to me until it was suggested? Yes, yes, I did say that. And who made that suggestion? Well, I imagine it must have been the police inspector investigating the case. I imagine so. Dr. Castle, had you given a death certificate before the thought of arsenic poisoning had been suggested to you, what would you have stated as the cause of death? <coughs> Well, I would most likely have said that death was due to acute congestion and inflammation of the stomach caused by gastroenteritis. Thank you, Dr. Castle. That is very helpful. After a masterly cross-examination of someone who should have proved a cast-iron witness for the prosecution, Sir Charles Russell opened his case for the defence. A hotel waiter from America testified that he saw the deceased regularly taking arsenic in beef tea. A Liverpool chemist used to give James Maybrick a pick-me-up come aphrodisiac, containing arsenic as many as four or five times a day. Then Sir Charles made a request to the judge. My lord, I should like to request that the prisoner be allowed to make a statement to the court and that it be treated as evidence for the defence. Well, yes, Sir Charles, I will allow the prisoner to make a statement, but two things must be clearly understood. Firstly, that any statement would not be under the sanction of an oath, and secondly, it cannot then be subject to cross-examination. Thank you, my lord. Mrs. Maybrick, do you wish to make a statement? Yes, sir. My lord, I wish principally to speak of the flypapers which were bought with the intention of using them for a cosmetic. Before my marriage, and since, for many years, I have been in the habit of using a face wash prescribed for me by Dr. Grace of Brooklyn. The solution was made up of arsenic, obtained by soaking fly papers mixed with elderflower water and lavender. To avoid evaporation of the scent, I covered the basin containing the solution with a plate and towels. I was making the face wash at this time because I had a skin problem and had my husband been well enough to go, we were to have attended a ball the following week. Mr. Maybrick was most particular that I shouldn't have any blemishes on my face. Mrs. Maybrick, do you also wish to make a statement concerning the jug of meat essence which was found to contain traces of arsenic? Yes. Yes, I do. At the time my husband was ill, a white packet containing his powder was on the table by the bed. An ordinary packet, tied with string, open at the end. As well as I remember, about 5 p.m. on Thursday night, two days before he died, I went and sat on the bed by the side of him. Oh, Flory, I don't feel well. I know. Oh, God, this sickness is making me so depressed. Don't distress yourself, my darling. I'm sure you'll be feeling better soon. No, 
I'm not going to be around much longer. Uh, I feel so weak. Baby. Sorry. I need some of my powder. It's on the table there, by the books. James, I can't. I need it, Rory. Just put it into that milk and beef juice. When I was in America, I used to get the chef in the hotels to mix it into my meals for me. I can take quantities of that stuff that'd kill someone else. And anyway, there can only be a little bit left in the packet. I don't know what to do. Do what I ask you, please. Put the powder into the jug. And what if someone comes in and sees? We'll take it into the dressing room. If you're quick about it, no one will see. No one need know. Oh, Florrie, I beg you to do this for me. All right. If you're sure you need it. Oh, thank you, Florrie. My lord, I was anxious, overwrought, miserably unhappy. And my husband's distress utterly unnerved me. I took the milk jug into the dressing room where I mixed in the powder. I put it all in, about as much as would lie on a three-penny bit. My lord, I had not one true or honest friend in the house. I had no one to consult and no one to advise me. On returning to the room, I found my husband had fallen asleep. So I placed the jug on the table by the window where he would not see it. And that's where it remained till Mr. Michael Maybrook took possession of it. Until a few minutes before this terrible charge was made against me, my lord, no one had informed me that a death certificate had been refused or that a post-mortem examination had taken place or that there was any reason to suppose that my husband died from anything other than natural causes. The judge's summing up was less than impartial. If the prisoner had the relationship with the man Briarly, which is indicated by the evidence, I hardly know how to put it other than like this. If a woman does carry on an adulterous intrigue with another man, it may provide, and I won't go further, it may provide a very strong motive why she should wish to get rid of her husband. The jury took just three quarters of an hour to reach their verdict. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Prisoner at the bar, I am no longer at liberty to treat you as being innocent of the dreadful crime laid to your charge. You have been convicted by a jury of this city, and the law leaves me no discretion. I must therefore pass upon you the sentence of the law. You will be taken from this place to a place of execution, where you will be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. Though sentenced to death, Florence Maybrick never walked to the gallows. The public was shocked and surprised by the verdict. The prosecution evidence, particularly the medical evidence, was so contradictory that the people wanted and expected an acquittal. Petitions for reprieve containing half a million signatures were sent to the Home Office, the Queen, and the Prince and Princess of Wales. Hours before Mrs. Maybrick was to be hanged, the Home Secretary commuted her sentence to life imprisonment. Although at that time there was no system for a criminal to appeal against a sentence, additional evidence continued to come to light showing James Maybrick to have been a regular user of arsenic. So did Florence Maybrick merely help her husband to take a fatal overdose, or did she deliberately kill the middle-aged hypochondriac in the hope of starting a new life with her lover? In January 1904, after she'd served 15 years in prison, the Home Secretary reconsidered her case and Mrs. Maybrick was released. Soon afterwards, she left England for America. The case of the Liverpool poisoner was finally closed. But the questions which it raised eventually helped to bring about the establishing of a court of criminal appeal. In the case of the Liverpool poisoner, Written by Brian Sibley, the cast was James Maybrick, Sean Baker, Florence Maybrick, Tony G. Barry, Addison, Terence Edmund, Russell, Michael Cochran, Judge Stevens, Stephen Thorne, Dr. Hopper, Gavin Muir.
The Big Bow Mystery is an 1892 mystery novel by the British writer Israel Zangwill. It was originally serialized in the Star newspaper in 1891, before being published as a novel the following year. Set in London's East End, it is one of the earliest examples of the locked room mystery genre. Inspector Crawford. Inspector Crawford. Inspector Crawford, won't you please help me? Inspector Crawford. Uh, uh, what the devil's going on? Inspector Crawford, thank the Lord. You was come across her once. Something has happened. You strapped up. And you? That's all this noise about, woman. Something terrible. You're jabbering, woman, and you've woken me up. A terrible! Uh, Mr. Constant. What sir. about Mr. Constant? It's Mr. Constant, sir. What is it about Mr. Constant? He's dead. Dead? Murdered, sir. In his bed. God love him. What? How? I don't know, sir. I can't get to him. I've been knocking on his door for the best part of an hour, and there's no single word of an answer. So I knock louder and louder oh. and... <laughs> Is that all? That's the reason I'll get a chill in my head. He's no more dead than I am. Just dog-tired. He gave three speeches yesterday. No, sir. He'll never be tired again. He's... All right, all right. Stop your moaning. Have the whole street awake. Down in five minutes. Seven thirty, Mr. Constant. It's seven thirty. Oh, come on, old man. You've got poor Mrs. Drabdump in a fluster, and you've got me out of bed. I knock your loudest. You'll not wake him now. <clears throat> Locked and bolted. Right, stand back. Mrs. Drabdump. Oh, my God. The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwill. Dramatized by Robert Messick. That's it, love. You take a seat there. Mrs. Drabdump, Inspector Wick. Thank you, Constable. Mrs. Drabdump, hmm. I just need to ask you a couple of questions. I'll do my best, sir. I've read your statement and I just want to clarify a few things, if I may. Um, you were unable to wake your lodger and went straight to your neighbour, Mr. Grobman. Well, he's an officer of the law. He deals with this type of thing all the time. He's an ex-officer, retired some time ago. Oh, I don't reckon you forget what you once learnt. How did you know Arthur Constant hadn't already left? Without his hat and coat in this weather? No, sir. Besides, he'd have woken me up. I've never slept well. Your other lodger, Mr Mortlake, his <laughs> leaving didn't wake you? Well, that's just it, sir. I... I'd overslept, sir. I never oversleeps. Be lucky if I get more than four hours. If you could take me through exactly what happened after you found the body... Uh... Inspector Grobman took charge. He covered up the poor man's face and Mr. then he Grobman, called for help. If you'd care to share your findings with us? Certainly. Yeah. Uh, ah. <coughs> Body was still warm when discovered. Throat cut. Death immediate. Ah. Life had been extinct for an estimation some two or three hours. The door had been bolted as well as locked, both from the inside. The windows, likewise. No sign of a struggle. Indeed, a purse of gold sat on the bedside table. Hmm. I engineered a thorough search of the room and the deceased gentleman's clothing. You did what? I searched for the murder weapon. You interfered with a crime scene. <coughs> <coughs> sir. What is it, Constable? Still no sign of the murder weapon all the way the murderer got in, sir. Well, keep checking. He must have gone in somehow. The window is still our best option. Up 18 foot of sheer wall. Hmm. Only way in would have been through the chimney. And make a search of the surrounding roofs. Which, unless we're searching for a particularly vicious baby, is unlikely. <laughs> Thank you.
constable. Mr. Thomas Mortlake. Call me Tom. You also lodged at Mrs. Drab Dumps and had left extremely early that morning. And before five, I had to catch the 520 to Plymouth. But you didn't. You ended up on the 0715 train from Paddington. I missed it. Damn fog. So I got the next train to Plymouth. When was the last time you came across the deceased? <sighs> About a quarter past nine, two evenings before. And why was that, exactly? Well, I'd received a letter from a mutual friend, which worried me, and um, well, I, I went to discuss it with other. And what was the deceased's reaction? He was in a great deal of pain. And why exactly was he in such pain, Mr Mortlake? We had toothache. Oh, toothache. You're hoping what you read in the papers is true, aren't you, Inspector? That our relationship was one of rivalry. That we argued that night and I killed him. Arthur Constant was a true champion of the Labour movement, who wanted, as did I, the working man to have his God-given right to be just like all of you. Can you imagine that, Inspector? Hmm. The working man finally having a say in the way the empire, his empire, the one he has slaved and died to build, is run. Can you imagine anything quite so wonderful? No, sir, I cannot. My politics are a problem for you. Your politics are irrelevant to this case. Politics are seldom irrelevant to anything, Inspector. Thank you, thank you. Gentlemen, it's our role in this coroner's court to attempt to find answers. Did the unfortunate suffer at his own hand or at the hand of another person? For those can be the only two options. The body was found in a room that was locked from the inside at every conceivable entrance. No one could have exited the room and left it in that state. Nor could they have left without attracting the attention of the landlady, a confessed light sleeper. We must therefore conclude the victim could not have been murdered. Uh, the cut on the throat was so deep as to cleanly sever the upper portion of the windpipe and the jugular vein. After completing the cut, the deceased would have had to place his right hand under his head and then clasp his left. But we've already been told that death was instantaneous. But there was no sign of a murder weapon or, or of any blood on the hand. I think, therefore, gentlemen, that you will agree with me that the victim could not have committed suicide. Where does that lead? So, what verdict should we pass? All I can suggest is a verdict acknowledging our complete inability to determine anything at all. Dear sir, I feel that to conclude this investigation with nothing more than an open verdict is to do a great disservice to a great deal of people. It is with a sense of community pride, therefore, that I can reveal I have hit on the answer to the big bow mystery. I believe that the true culprit was a monkey of the organ-grinding variety, trained to alight up the outside wall and then enter the room by use of a... Glass cutter containing a diamond within. Then, swallowing the murder weapon, he... Bolted the door behind him with powerful magnets before... Vanishing via a ladder concealed within the swirling fog. Sir, so, I read with delighted interest the plethora of theories that are circulating throughout your pages. We all clearly share the same belief, that the open verdict was completely unsatisfactory. If Scotland Yard is content to relegate one of the foulest crimes of the century to the back of a filing cabinet, then I find myself asking, what has become of this once great institution? other people in charge truly imbued with the age, experience and skill to fulfil their duty. I would be grateful. grateful if, anyone if anyone who shares, shares a similar disappointment in the passive creature that the Yard has become would make their feelings known in the press. Yours truly, Inspector George Grodman, formerly of Scotland Yard. Who does he think he is? Who's he to comment on the state of Scotland Yard? Unfortunately, he believes he is Scotland Yard. Denzel Cantercott, Chief Inspector Wimp. Inspector. I'll give it time. I have an appointment with you this afternoon, don't I? Indeed. And I consider myself fortuitous to have bumped into you at this point in the day. Perhaps we can begin early. I was about to have lunch this afternoon, uh, will be more... It's concerning the big bow mystery, as I believe it's now been dubbed. 
You do realise that the case received an open verdict? I do indeed. But you must realise that that is not a decision that sits particularly well with the public. Is that a matter for concern? Well, if the populace are unsatisfied, Mr Inspector, how can we hope to get our jobs done? I could always take my information elsewhere. To other interested parties, say, perhaps, uh, to Inspector Grodman. Mr Grodman? He can contribute nothing to this case. He speaks equally highly of you. What is your relationship with Mr Grodman? I work with him, chiefly in an epistolatory manner. You're a secretary? Oh, well, yes. And what would Mr Grodman think of you coming to see me? Well, he'd find it ridiculous that I would take something so valuable to one uh, so young who has clearly chosen marriage over his career. I see. You can't detect and have a wife. The two don't go together. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. You better come in now. Oh, a gentleman. A uh, gentleman. Have a seat. Well, oh. it, um, it struck me you might not refuse me a fiver for my aid. Should you deserve it, the money is yours. Oh, splendid. Uh, tea? I'm sorry? Well, I can't help but notice you have a pot of freshly brewed tea there and was wondering whether you were about to offer me the same. Come to the point. Uh, my suggestion concerns Tom Mortlake. Thomas Mortlake? Labour leader fighting for the vote of the working class. I'm aware of who he is. Tom Mortlake had a sweetheart, Jesse Diamond. Well, where is that sweetheart now? Where indeed? She is gone. Yes, without a trace. Without a trace. About a fortnight before Mr Constance's murder. And what makes you so sure it was murder? Well, Grodman says so. Isn't that rather proof that it was suicide? <laughs> <clears throat> they were engaged. To be married. To each other. Shortly before she disappeared, I happened to be walking past her home in Stepney Green. Mr Canticock, I am a busy man. A lamp was burning. It cast a shadow. Lamps do that. Two shadows. And the other was not Mortlake's. He was busy at the docks in Liverpool giving some rousing speech or other. The other shadow belonged to Arthur Constant, God rest his soul. I waited to make sure who it was. And why do you think Mr Constant was calling on Jesse Diamond? Well, who can say? But it can't be easy being the sweetheart of such an important young man as Thomas Mortlake. I dare say she was lonely. And what would you dare say Mr Mortlake felt about these meetings? Oh, Mr Inspector. We're both men of the world. Were we to have a sweetheart such as Jesse Diamond, a, a young lady that other men found pleasing on the eye, would we really condone her being visited by other eligible bachelors? Particularly an eligible bachelor who was our chief rival in the line of work which we had chosen to pursue. Do you mean to accuse Mr Mortlake of the murder no, no, of no, our... no, 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 no! Perish the very thought of it! I only wish to fulfil my civic duty and deliver what I know. Sovereign. A sovereign? I should get a sovereign for deigning to walk into his office. Well? If your well is to ask me whether your aim was fulfilled and I've yet again been humiliated by dignity in tatters, hanging by the tiniest of threads, then I'd have to answer in the positive. Denzel, you know I care little for your dignity, but I do care for my time, which you're now wasting. What was his response? He was intrigued and will investigate it further. He'll reopen the case? I believe he will, yes. Now, uh, if I could just ask for my payment. In my day, murders were not overlooked simply because they were somewhat difficult in their solving. Uh, quite. An open verdict is no verdict at all. And you are no longer a detective. I am a detective for as long as I am able to solve crimes. And I plan to devote every waking hour to solving this one. Inspector Edward Wimp may have given up, but I have not. May God be keeping you company, Mr Constant. Safe and warm, safe and warm. My apologies it all had to end up this way. It's not what you deserved, sir. No. <coughs> <gasps> 
Is visiting graves a common Boxing Day pastime? You want to be careful creeping up on people, especially in a place like this. Especially after what's happened. Forgive me, I didn't mean to cause you any fright. Won't you come under my umbrella? You must be drenched to the skin. It don't matter, sir. I can't take no hurt. I've had the rheumatics this twenty year. Well, my mother-in-law has a remedy. She swears by... Lord only knows what's in it. Um, Inspector Wimp, Scotland Yard. I remember you. I don't make it a habit to pass the time with strange men otherwise. Do you make it a habit of visiting the graveyard? I know a lot of people here. Oh. I thought coming here might help me think. May I ask you a question? We could go and get some cocoa. My visit's not finished yet. Of course. Uh, Mr Mortlake left the house extremely early that morning, didn't he? Well before five. Sounds about right. He had to catch the first train going to... to... Oh, this has dragged up the memory. I fear it's fading with the years. Oh, there'll be a lot more to go than that. I used to be able to pick up a face in Stepney if I was standing in Whitechapel. Now it's a good day if I can see the marks on the back of my hands. My mother-in-law can't stand up straight in cold weather. Oh, gets us all. Don't care if you're a king or a kitchen boy. We all grow old. Very lucky. Plymouth. He was going to Plymouth. That's right, thank you. But um, he missed that first train, didn't he? Witnesses saw him miss that train. Mm. Owlborn is a bit of a blur. The oversleeping. I've made my apologies for that and I can't do no more. No one's blaming you. These things happen. Not to me, they don't. I've been up at the same time since long before Mr Drabdump passed on. Every morning like clockwork. Earlier if there was comings and goings. That morning I slept like the dip. Until just after six. How do you account for the extra sleepiness? If I knew I'd be a happier woman. So you have no idea what time Mr Mortlake left, or indeed if he came back in? All I can be definite about is my cup of tea before bed. You had something to drink before going to bed? I like my cup of tea. I take it strong without sugar. It always steadies my nerves. Where were you when Mr Mortlake told you he was going to Plymouth? At the table in the kitchen. The night before? Yes, sir. Drinking your tea? Drinking my tea. And this was the night before the death? That's right, sir. Poor Mr Constance, last night on earth. Have you rented out Mr Constance's rooms yet? No, not yet. I think you should let me buy you that cocoa. Oh, got caught in the downpour there, Mr Mortlake. Uh, There'll be a few more who won't live to see the new year. You mark my words. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. I, I really am very tired and have some correspondence to complete. I've taken in another lodger. I thought you should know. Arrived today. You rented out Arthur's rooms already? I explained all that had gone on, but he was very insistent. And I still have bills to pay, murder or no murder, or suicide or whatever it is they're calling it these days. Either way, I won't apologise for the speed of it. Good night, Mrs Drabdon. Dear Jessie, I've just been asked to unveil Arthur's portrait at the club in a few weeks' time. They thought it would be an honour. How could they have known that whilst I stand on the stage addressing my peers, my thoughts will only be of you and he together? Rodman. Mr Wim. Inspector. Likewise. Wasn't expecting to see you here. I found the body. They thought I should see the painting. You? Business. You remember how it is. Oh, working on the big bow. Police business. I'm not at liberty to divulge what it's... No. No, of course not. No. But the case has been reopened. Uh, uh, I am not at... uh, Just a few questions, sir. Have there been any developments in the big bow mystery? I'm not at liberty to divulge. Well, hang about this, Grobman. Inspector Grobman, Inspector oh, Grobman. Inspector yeah, Grobman, a moment of your time, please, sir. Yeah, not today, Peter. Oh, no, I'm needed inside. However, if this murder investigation is not put back at the top of the Yard's priority list, we will all have witnessed an even greater crime. It isn't your place to discuss this investigation. I'm only expressing my opinions as a member of the public. 
We should take our seats. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy centre stage whilst you can, Mr. Portman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is with a mixture of melancholy and pride that I take to this stage today. Arthur Constant was a man of undoubted ability and honesty who had a vision that one day the working classes of this great empire would be able to hold their heads up high and be able to say, I am a man! Yeah. Let this portrait forever stand as a representation of Arthur and as a reminder to us all of our responsibility to one another. Thomas Mortlake, I'm arresting you for the murder of Arthur Constant. This is some sort of joke. I would ask that you come quietly, sir. A vindictive and ill-thought joke. And I do have to remind you that there are police at every single exit. There is no way of leaving. This is a foul and damnable lie! Yeah. <laughs> boys! Boys! I ask you now. I want to know if it's likely a man would murder his best friend. <laughs> this is police business, and I would ask you all Once to... Once again, the hard-working man is being stamped upon by those who do not wish to see him succeed. Mr Mortlake... What I have to say scares them. It terrifies them. So what do they do? They try to silence me, but will it work? No! Will they silence us? No! no! Constant, if it? If it? Sit down and three groans for the police. Mr. Mortlake, I suggest you try. Read all about it. Riot at Break a Day Club. Tom Mortlake arrested. The nation holds their breath. If it please the court, I propose to show that the prisoner murdered his colleague and friend, Mr. Arthur Constant, in cold blood and with the most careful premeditation. Premeditation so studied as to leave the circumstances of the death an impenetrable mystery to all the world, though fortunately without altogether baffling the almost Superhuman ingenuity of Inspector Edward Wimp. Read all about it! Wimp posed as lodger to find incriminating evidence! From a letter found between the pages of a railway manual in Thomas Mortlake's room. If you'd be so kind, Mr Mortlake. From where I've marked, please, sir. <clears throat> There is no escaping the truth, but please don't blame Arthur for my mistake. Whatever he has done, he has been a good friend, and you should always remember that. Goodbye, dear. May you always be happy and find a worthier wife than I. Yours till death, Jessie. Who is Jessie Diamond? May I remind you, you are under oath. She was my fiancée. And this was the last contact you had with her, correct? Yes. You received this two nights before Arthur Constant's death. On reading this letter, you went round to Constant in a rage, wanting to know the truth. The man couldn't deny it. You had the proof in your hands. Yes, Mr. Mortlake I... was angry. He was embarrassed. He wanted his revenge on this competitor in both love and business. That isn't the And way... one night and one day later, he had it in the most successful and brutal way possible. Read all about it. Big bone mystery solved. More late to hand. Inspector Crobman. They didn't tell me you were coming. At times, I find it best to keep a low profile. How are you? <sighs> Scared. Uh, of course. They're going to hang me. Yes. Which is why we have to think extra carefully of anything at all that will prove you couldn't have been in bow to cut his throat. Uh, 
Do you mind? No, no, please. Now then. Mm. The crime of passion scenario is not worth refuting. Your fiancé was cheating on you with your colleague. I imagine slitting his throat was probably something you were considering. But, ah, yes, here. Wimp proved, wishes to say, created a reasonable possibility that you were seen at Paddington, missing the first train, then rushed back, did the deed, and returned to Paddington to catch the second train at 7.15 a.m. Yes? Yes. And the night before, you drugged Mrs. Drabdump's tea, thus ensuring she wouldn't wake up when you returned. Now, how you were meant to have locked and bolted the door from the inside is, though it pains me to say it, a very plausible explanation, but not important. He's built a strong case against you. Doesn't the fact that he entered my rooms and went through my belongings without permission count for anything? Sadly, no. <laughs> These new detecting techniques bear scant regard for the law. Then I'm finished. You are not. Do you honestly think I would allow Wimp to get credit for something that he's so utterly wrong about? You believe me? I believe that when Edward Wimp says something is so, it invariably is not. The man's barely old enough to feed himself, let alone investigate cases of a criminal nature, especially one as intriguing as this. You said that he had a strong case. If there's one thing you can rely on, it is the highly alterable nature of the mind of the general populace. And as soon as I find a way to alter it, you'll be the first to know. Cut. Have courage. Original poetry. Compose while you wait. Only a shilling a composition. Perfect for your loved ones, your friends. Hello, damsel. Oh, you're bad for business. Go away. You've been avoiding me again. Just trying to make an honest living. Seen this? I've decided to turn away from the papers. It's too depressing. They seldom print the happy stories. Read it. If Tom Mortlake hangs, you go to Pendonville. Uh, date of execution set, three weeks from today. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Prison? Why? You don't think that I murdered? No. Then why? I was quite content for you to go and tell Wimp everything you knew. Show him there were other possibilities, that the verdict was wrong. I didn't expect you to hand him an open and shut case. The nation is hanging on his every word calling him the mystery man of Scotland Yard. And I warn you now, if Wimp comes out of this looking anything other than the incompetent he is, I'll hold you solely responsible and call you to account for any number of things lurking in your murky little past. <laughs> well, how can I stop Tom hanging? In any way you can. Write letters under all sorts of names to all the papers. Get everyone you know to do the same. Start up a petition. Find a witness that saw Mortlake at Paddington between 5.20 and 7.15. You have one chance, Cantercott. One chance only. And make this better, or spend the next ten years behind bars. Come on. Come on, think, man. The answer's staring you in the face. It has to be. <laughs> Grotman. Not today. Not today, please. He's an old man. A has-been. He's no longer even a detective. Mr. What? Wimp. This continuing rivalry is anything but healthy. Inspector Wimp. And how did you get in? I still have a little influence at the yard. In fact, the boys round here seemed rather pleased to see me. I have a lot to do at the moment. Chiefly trying to sort out the mess you've caused. And the crowd practically want to lynch me. People change their minds. This isn't detecting, it's manipulation. In a few short hours, an innocent man is going to hang. 
I'm trying to avoid it happening. Innocent, you say? Well, the court has decided he's a murderer who cut a man's throat in cold blood. Just because the papers have turned him into a hero... Who, by this evening, will be a martyr. <laughs> and I think you're starting to get nervous. I think you should leave. Hmm. I think you're starting to question your evidence and finding it wanting. I think you're starting to wonder whatever will happen to you if he does hang and it was discovered that you'd made a mistake, that you were chiefly responsible for sending an innocent man to his death. Look, I don't want to have you thrown out. Well, I'm presenting you with an escape. But don't think I won't. Oh, for God's sake, man, listen to what I'm offering. I can make this whole mess go away. Look at you, you're a wreck. Bellowing, marching round your office. You have five minutes. Have you ever given any attention to the science of evidence? It's what I do for a living. No, no, no. And I mean no disrespect by this, truly, but it is so extremely subtle that it takes years to fully comprehend, and I fear you have a little way to go. Mr. Grodman... But what lies on the surface, Edward? Lies. Now is not the time for a philosophical debate. We spend our whole lives chained to the desk or the shop counter. We come to expect things to behave in a certain way, and as a result, we become blind to the reality. Has it ever struck you that we never see anyone more than once, if that. It depends on what we've heard, what kind of a day we're having, what we had for breakfast. The second time, our vision is coloured and modified by the memory of the first. Yes, yes, all right, I see what you're saying. Do our friends appear to us as they do to strangers? Exactly. Can a mother see her baby's ugliness that clearly exists for the rest of the world? No, no, of course not. And if you put her on the stand... She'd swear she had the most beautiful babe in the world. The eye sees, sometimes, most of the time, what it wishes to see. What it expects to see. The ear hears likewise. A man hangs in very little time. Make your point. I just have. Well, I don't... You suspected Mortlake from the start. I'll admit, I was suspicious. His trip to Paddington Station, the missed trains, just too convenient. You didn't like him. Couldn't stand his politics. Votes for the working man, preposterous. I hope you're not suggesting I would prejudice a case due to my personal feelings about us. You wanted him to be guilty. And the first chance you got to construct a case against him, you took it. I reopened the case because I was presented with some new information and I resolved either to quash or confirm these suspicions. It's called police work. It's called a vendetta. I found a key to Constance's bedroom, a razor, a letter from his fiancée confessing to the affair she'd had with the man who two days later was found with his throat slit. Evidence. Conjecture. All of it. Mortlake drugging Mrs. Drabdump. His desperate race across London, shrouded by the fog, spurred on by jealousy and revenge, the stuff of popular novels. But take me through once more how you claim the door appeared to be locked. Oh, I don't have time for games. Precisely. So kindly desist from playing them and carry out my request. The door was never bolted from the inside. You merely assumed it was. The main staple containing the bolt was loosened by the killer, who closed the door behind him and escaped. When you tried the door, gently at first, politely... It didn't open. But when I broke down the door... The loosened bolt fell to the floor. Yes. Bravo. Do you know... It had never occurred to me as a possible explanation for what took place until you came up with it. It was brilliant. Thank you. But quite wrong. There is a far more straightforward answer. The door was bolted from the inside. By whom? By Mr Constant. Who else was in the room? 
He did it every night before he went to sleep. I do it myself. He came to me on the evening of the third. Wait, wait, wait. You saw him the night before his death? Well, what time? Why didn't you tell me this before? You never asked me the question. Oh, damn it, man! Why would he come and see you? We were friends. We used to talk long into the night about politics, philosophy, put the world to rights. I'd cultivated his friendship ever since he'd moved across the road. Oh, he must have been honoured. May you never suffer the indignity of retirement. Hmm? Mock all you like, Inspector. It's the privilege of the young. But your time will come. I had a great career. And I should think that those who were unfortunate enough to replace me have suffered because of it. They turned me into an idle old man. They gave me retirement, and they took away everything. My apologies. Mine too. I appear to have vendettas of my own. Did you know that all I've done since they made me retire is read? And you know what I've concluded? All the crimes committed, no matter how brilliantly executed, were dismal failures. They were caught. I caught every one of my criminals over simple mistakes. And the public think you're a hero. And they know very little. Do you think it can be done? The perfect crime? The perfect murder? With all that you know about the methods of collecting evidence, the way our minds work, hmm? a hypothesis? Academically, anything is possible. Yeah, academically. What did you talk about that night with Constant? A girl. Jessie Diamond. At the time, he didn't say. He was in an awkward situation and needed some money to help her out. I was so flattered that he would talk to me about this. Uh, I did what I could. I spoke to him in a fatherly manner and tendered some vague advice about the girl. But most of all, I preached the importance of a good night's sleep for solving the world's woes and gave him a sleeping draught. The toothache? He was in terrible pain and had run himself into the ground. I made him promise he'd take it, as well as locking and bolting his doors and windows to stop the cold air from getting in. Which, of course, he did. Look, can we return Inspector to... Wimp, please. You yourself said that a man's life hangs in the balance, as indeed does your career. Apply that brain. Mrs. Crabdump is unable, by repeated violent knocking, to arouse her lodger. Her personality is one prone to panic. She runs across to get me, the nearest and the most authoritative. I burst open the door. What do you think she expected to see? Well, Mr. Constant murdered, I suppose. Exactly. And so she saw it. And what do you think was the condition of Arthur Constant when the door burst open? Well, was he not dead? A healthy young man like that. He was asleep, aided by the draught granted, else the hammering would have woken him. You mean to say you found Arthur Constant alive? As you are, right now. Well, then when was he murdered? Immediately afterwards. By whom? I keep thinking perhaps I've been harsh with my assessment of you. But perhaps I've not been harsh enough. You mean to say Mrs. Drapdump? Inspector. My God. Calm yourself. It was a solitary experiment. Anything is possible academically, correct? I had to know. Really know. So I put everything in motion. The late night chats. The sleeping draught. You knew she'd run across to you. And if she hadn't, the murder would never have happened. He was asleep when you burst through the door. I cried, my God! as if I saw some awful vision. And whilst Mrs. Drabdump cowered back... You administered the fatal cut. Precisely. So deep and so sharp that there was scarce a drop of blood. Everything else was as the trial found. 
I pocketed the vial of sleeping draught and the razor, and delayed calling for help, so that my story of death occurring within two hours was believable. But, but you've not given me a moment's peace. You've attacked me continuously in the press, pushing and pushing for answers. You, you would have got away with it. An open verdict. It disgusted me. All my work for that, an open verdict is no verdict at all. An insult. I wanted men to be up and doing and trying to find me out. I wanted the hunt. I needed the hunt. You sent Canticott to me. You knew I couldn't resist a chance to get one over on you. I've tried everything at my disposal to turn this around and everything has failed. So now, I play my last card. Huh. That all my work should come to nothing. That you're allowed to go down in posterity as the solver of the unsolvable mystery, the greatest detective ever. No, sir. No. So, you've come here to tell me this. To reveal your crime to the world purely out of spite. Call it what you will. <laughs> I fail to see the humour. Mortlake reprieved. How can they know? Oh, those evening papers are amazing. How quickly they can push out a story, but then they have had a good few hours. Look, I don't... I don't think I understand. Then listen very carefully. You were right. Everything you've accused me of, I was too hasty. Let my personal feelings dictate my decisions. I've just spent the afternoon with a home secretary. Admitted my doubts. Asked for longer to find the answer. But you told me he was the murderer. He cut a man's throat in cold blood. I said that was the thinking of the court. You threatened to throw me out. Because I thought you were wasting my time. <laughs> oh, my dear Mr Grodman. I fear you heard what you wanted to hear. So, where do we go now? You've told me everything. Probably saved my career, and I do plan to take credit for solving the unsolvable. Reveal how I set a trap for the George Grodman. Luring him into my office, risking life and limb for justice. The stuff of popular novels. I'm afraid you leave me very little choice. I could shoot you now. But where's the challenge? They find you in here with a smoking gun. Open and shut case. Open and shut case. So put the weapon down. Put the gun down, Inspector. George... Case closed, Inspector. In The Big Bow Mystery, Inspector Grodman was played by John Woodvine, Inspector Wimp by David Holt, Mrs. Drabdump, Carolyn Pickles, Mortlake, David Thorpe, Canticott, Chris Moran, and the coroner and prosecutor, Stephen Critchlow. All other parts were played by members of the cast. The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwill was dramatised by Robert Messick and directed by David Ian Neville. Maygray in Montmartre, Maygray investigates the random murders of a countess and a showgirl and discovers a dark secret that links their past lives at the Grand Hotel in Nice. Your beers, monsieur. Thank you. Your health, Jules. 
It was a good party, I'd say. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Well, it was La Pointe's first baby. We had to push the boat out a bit. Your health, Sean. How long has he been married? Oh, well, two years. At one time we thought he'd stay a bachelor the rest of his life. Unlike you. I've never thought of you as anything but a married man. Oh, I was single once. Before I knew you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can I interest you in a little club for later this evening? Hmm? Entertainment, drinks, girls, strip tease, all the way down to the... Oh, I beg your pardon, I didn't realise it was you, Chief Inspector. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, good evening. No offence. <laughs> uh, who was that? The grasshopper. At least that's what they call him around Montmartre. Touts for a club by the name of... Uh, oh, um, wait a minute. Um, Le Street Hot. No, that's not it. Well, that's what he says on this card. Hmm? Well, then he must have changed jobs, or maybe the other place has closed down. Um, Picrats, that was it. I think. No, La Pointe would remember, even if you and I can't. Why La Pointe? Oh, really, Georges, your memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because his first real job with headquarters centered around Picrats. Or whatever it was called. Mm. Mm. No, it was the first time young La Pointe actually worked on a case. Didn't just sit around in the office learning the ropes. And because. Mm hmm? Do you really not remember, Georges? You tell me, Jules. <laughs> because it was the time young La Pointe grew up, all in the course of a week, fell in love for the first time and killed someone for the first time. Ah, yes, in Montmartre. Maigre in Montmartre, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Oh, that's right. On a Monday night, or to be strictly accurate, Tuesday morning, according to the report from the La Rochefoucauld police station. Inspector Lognon's district, wasn't it? <laughs> you are remembering. Is he still there? Yes, he'll die there. No ambition, that was it. And no imagination. Plods doggedly on, never questions those placed in authority over him. A model policeman. Well, you might have thought so. If only he'd told me to keep my nose out of his cases, he'd have been a chief inspector years ago. But would you have taken any notice? Well, that's besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there was this young woman, fairly obviously drunk, who comes in to make a statement, goes up to the sergeant at the desk. I want to make a statement. Go ahead. It's about a crime. Well, there's been a crime committed. I don't know whether it's been committed. Well, then... But it probably will be committed. In fact, it's certain to be. I see. <sighs> Who told you? These two men. Two men? Clients at the club. I, I work at Picrats. Ah, uh, yes. You do the nude act, don't you? Yes. So, some clients have been talking to you about a crime. Not to me. Who to, then? They were discussing it together. And... You were listening? Yes. They were at the next table on, on the other side of the petition. When was this? About two hours ago. And what exactly did you hear? Well, they didn't say much, and I couldn't hear at all. M music was going on. But one of them said he was going to kill the Countess. I did hear that. Which Countess? Don't know. Well, what did he say about killing her? Don't remember. I wasn't alone. Ah, you were with... A client. Someone you knew? Yes. Who? His first name's Albert. I don't know his other name. Go on. Well, the first thing I heard was something like, she's still got most of the jewellery, but at the rate she's going, it won't last long. What was the voice like? Man's voice. M Middle-aged. When they went out, I, I saw one of them with short and grey head. Must have been him. Why? Because the other one was younger and wasn't a young man's voice. What names did they use? I think... One of them was called Oscar. Go and sit down. Can't I go home? Not yet. I'll make a report. 
What's your name? Arlette. Arlette. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and as Lorient wasn't around and the statement seemed to involve a threat of murder, the sergeant had her brought over to us at the Quai des Orfèvres. It was about three o'clock in the morning when she arrived. By then, she decided she didn't want to tell us anything after all, so I sent her back to her flat. I went home myself for a few hours' sleep, returned to the office and was just about to phone Lorient to put him in the picture when... Yes? Mickey? Yeah. No, you're here. Hmm. I understand the girl who said she'd overheard some talk about murdering a countess was brought round to you by one of my sergeants last night. Yeah, she left here about four o'clock this morning. Why? She's dead. Just been found by her concierge. I've not been round there yet. Thought I'd better ring you first, as headquarters seem to have shown such an interest. Mm. Perhaps we should all have taken her more seriously. Looks as though she may have been talking sense. Mm, looks like it. Well, I assume I'll see you at the flat then. I take it you have the address. Ah, Megre, I haven't disturbed anything. The doctor's still in the bedroom. No, oh, thank you, Lionel. It's a nicely kept place, isn't it? Mm. <coughs> Morning, Doctor. Morning, Chief Inspector. Well, she was dead when we got here, of course. The fellow who did it held on to her till he made sure of that. Mm. Can you say when it happened? Not more than an hour and a half ago. There's no trace of a struggle. He's probably hiding in here, waiting for her. Grabbed her by the throat the moment she'd taken her coat off. Mm. You know this district, Lognon. Did you ever see her before? No, no. I've heard about her act. And we found these photographs in a drawer. As you can see, it was a sort of striptease. Mm. She appears to have wriggled about, gradually taking off her dress. The only thing she had on. By the end, she was stark naked. Where was it she worked? Oh, one of these little Montmartre clubs. Picats off the Rue Pigalle. I see. Well, if anybody wants me, that's where I'll be. My husband will be down in a minute, Mr. McGray. Ah, oh, thank you. Did you tell him what I wanted to see him about? I asked him about the two men. He doesn't remember them. Mm. In fact, he's sure there wasn't anybody at the table next to our let's. There was an American over there who drank the best part of a bottle of whiskey... And there was a party of about six or so. They brought some girls in with them. But neither of us remember two men together. Oh, here he is. Fred, this oh. is Chief Inspector Maygray. Oh, now your face. From the papers. Fred Alfonso. Oh, oh. Oh. oh, dear. Didn't the wife ask you to have a drink? Oh, oh, she did, thank you, but not at the moment. Now, you're sure there were no clients at the table next to Arlette's last night? Table eight? No, positive. It's a small place. I keep an eye on everything the whole time. And you never saw, at that table, two men by themselves, one of them older than the other? Look, I've said no. Chief Inspector, what's all this about? Arlette is dead. What? Oh, no. Mm. She was strangled this morning in her bedroom. Good God. Oh, who did it? Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. Now, she overheard a conversation here last night between two men who were talking about a countess. One of the men seems to have been called Oscar. Well, if there'd been two men here, I'd have noticed. You know how this kind of place works. People don't come here to see first-class turns or dance to a good band. We mostly get foreigners. We imagine they're going to see something sensational. <laughs> The only sensational thing was Arlette undressing. Mm. Did she go to bed with the clients? Well, she must have now and then. With the young man who was here last night? Oh, no. No, not with him, I'm sure. he just come in one evening with a friend and fell for her. Straight away, you could see it. Oh, yeah. he come again several times, but he never waited till we closed. Probably had to get up early, go to work. Well, did she have any other regulars? Oh, none of our clients are regulars. They're all alike, of course, but they're always different. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you. Hey, well, hmm? I suppose I can open as usual this evening. No, yes. Oh, good. Well, if you care to drop in, you're welcome. Yes, I'll do that. If you want to contact me in the meantime, I'll be at the Quai des Orfèvres. Come in. Uh, yes, Lapointe, what is it? Can I speak to you, sir? Yes, of course. Well, come in, come in, sit down. Thank you, sir.
Well? When I saw her here last night, I wondered why she'd been brought in. Janvier told me what she'd been saying, and then the next I know... she's dead. Hmm. I'd forgotten for the moment that your first name was Albert. After what I let told Luca, he shouldn't have let her go off by herself without any protection at all. No, I know you've not been here very long, La Pointe, but you must have realised by now that if we had to give police protection to everyone who comes in with an accusation, we'd none of us have time for anything else. Yes, Chief, but... <laughs> but what? She was different. Hmm. How did you get to know her? Oh, I was with a friend. We went up to Montmartre together. We walked into Picrat's. Why? Well, no particular reason. It was the first place we saw. How long ago was this? Three weeks. Hmm. That's all, three weeks. And that was how you met her? She came and sat at our table. My friend thought she was a whore. We had a row when we got outside. About her? Yes. And you went back there? Yeah, the following night, to apologise for the way my friend had spoken to her. What had he actually said? He offered her money to sleep with him. And she refused? Of course. Did she say anything to you about being in danger? Well, not in so many words, but I knew there were some mysteries in her life. Mm, such as? Oh, it's difficult to explain. No one will believe me because I was in love with her. Mm. Was she in love with you? Last night I felt sure she was. Why? What did you talk about? Same as usual. About her and me. Did you ever go to bed with her? No. Did you ever ask her? No. And she never suggested? It? Never. What happened last night? Did... Did she say anything about it? No, she said you were with her, but she only mentioned your Christian name. I stayed at the club till half past two. At what table? Number six. Was there anybody at the next table to yours? No. Table eight? No, nobody. While you were talking to Arlette, she didn't seem as though she were listening to any other conversation. No, I'm sure she wasn't. Why? Mm. Would you like to work on the case with me, Lapointe? Yes, Chief, I would. Look, I'm not asking you because you were in love with her. No, sir. No, Magri. Yeah? Well, the name? And the rest? Thank you. A Countess von Farnheim has been found strangled in a flat in the Rue Victor Massé. Come on, Lapointe. Let's get there. Oh, anyone could live in a place like this, heaven alone knows. Yeah. You'd think at least she'd get someone to take the bottles away. Where is she? In the bedroom. Through here. Yeah, fine. Come on, Lapointe. Yes, sir. Nothing's been touched, of course. I had a feeling headquarters might want to take over. Yes, well... <laughs> Good Lord. Exactly. We found two hypodermics on that wine crepe by the bed. She's about 60 or so. Doctor's not arrived as yet. Mattress cover's been slit open, so either the motive was robbery or someone wants us to think it was. Oh, mind out for that chamber pot. It's half full. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, not at all. Uh, uh, this is the concierge, Madame Aubin. Mm. Madame Aubin, mm. Chief Inspector Maigret, and... Uh, uh, Inspector Lapointe. Oh, Madame. Madame. Inspector. Oh, I'll leave you all to it, then. Don't suppose you'll need the local police hanging around? Uh, thank you, Laura. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, have a look around, Lapointe. Right, sir. Well, now, madame, <coughs> did the country live alone? She did. Did she have many visitors? Well, there was this young man. Young man? Nice-mannered, sickly-looking boy with long hair. He used to visit her. <laughs> Called her aunt. You don't know his name? Never concerned myself with her affairs. Well, this desk, sir, is full of papers. Huh? She must have got every letter she ever got. There are hundreds of them. All from her husband, by the look of them. <laughs> Love letters. Oh, why not? She can't always have been like this. you better go through them. Do you want to do that here or take them back to headquarters? Well, I think I'd prefer to take them back, sir. No, I don't blame you. Thank you, madame. Au revoir, monsieur. Come on, let's get a breath of fresh air. Oh, my 
told you. Do you want a beer, Lafoine? Someone's going down to the brasserie, Delphine. Thank you, yes. Sandwich? No, thanks. I'll finish going through these first. Two beers and one ham sandwich. Right. Found anything? Well, according to these papers, she was living with her husband in Cannes up till 15 years ago in a house called the Oasis. Oh, there's a photo of it. Hmm, very pretty. And there's a photo of the husband, the Count von Farnheim. Hmm, not so pretty. How old was he? 65 when they married. She was about 35. Marriage only lasted three years, then he died. What of? Exhaustion? <laughs> I, I got under the police down there, and apparently there was an inquest. Well, you can see in that photo, the house is on the Corniche, and beyond the terrace there's a drop of about 300 feet or so. Well... The Count's body was found one morning lying at the foot of the precipice. The theory was that he'd gone outside for air and sat down on the balustrade, then just passed out and fallen. Oh, yes. There were no signs of violence on the body when it was found and no trace of poison was discovered at the autopsy. And what happened to her after that? Well, she lived on at the Oasis, entertained a great deal, gambled, drank. The local police say she had a string of gigolos, one after the other, and they got away with a good deal of her money. Mm -hmm. Then... Four years after the Count died, she suddenly sold up and disappeared. Never been seen on the Riviera again. Uh, is the Chief Inspector in? He's in his office, sir. Right. You, in here. Yes, all right. Keep an eye on this young man, will you? Yes, of course. Who is he? Well, I have reason to believe he may be a material witness in the case of the Countess von Farnheim. Hmm. Where did you pick him up? At the guard you know of. When? This morning, half past six. When you were both still in bed, I shouldn't wonder. Yeah, well, I'd better go in. Come in! I'm sorry to disturb you, Chief Inspector. No, not at all, only one. What can I do for you? The young man you said you wished to interview, friend of the late Countess. Yeah? He's outside. Oh, well, that was quick. Easy when you know the district, as we local police do. And this is the eighth time I've arrested him. Name of Mortemar, mm. Philippe Mortemar. He's a drug addict. Where does he live? Block of flats on the Boulevard Rochechouart. He wasn't there, though. He'd packed his bag, so I followed him. I know his haunts. He needed money to get away, and he was looking for someone to borrow from. How did you find him? The concierge saw him take the first bus for the guard you know. I found him in the waiting room and questioned him on the way over here. And? Hey, he either knows nothing or won't say anything. Mm. Was he the one who supplied the countess with drugs? Unless it was she who kept him supplied. Anyway, they've been seen around together for several months. If you don't need me any more... No, thank you, Lomio. You've done a good job. Then I'm not suggesting he killed the old woman. Well, neither am I. You're going to hold him? Uh, perhaps. Uh, tell him to come in, will you? Right. He's all yours, then. You, Mortimer, come in here. What do you want with me? A few questions. Thank you, Lomio. Yeah. Now, then. Was the Countess von Farnheim your mistress? She was my protectress. Mm. In other words, you didn't go to bed with her. She was interested in my writing. And gave you money? She helped me to get along. And drugs? Sometimes. Why? She was lonely. Hadn't she any friends? She was always alone. Can I sit down? No. Did you make love to her? I tried to give her pleasure. In her flat? Yes. How old are you? Twenty-eight. When did you begin taking drugs? Three or four years ago. Why? I don't know. Mm. Tell me about the Countess. I don't know anything. But tell me what you do know. <sighs> she used to be very rich. She was married to a man she didn't love. An old fellow who never gave her a moment's peace. And had her trailed by a private detective. Is that what she told you? Yes. He used to get a report every day, describing all she had said and done, almost minute by minute. Was she already taking drugs by then? I don't think so. He died, and everybody tried to grab the money he had left her. Uh, who was everybody? Uh, all the gigolos on the Riviera. Professional gamblers. Her women friends. Did she ever mention any names? 
Well, I don't remember any. Did you ever hear the name Oscar mentioned? I don't know anybody of that name. Mm. She never seemed to be afraid of anyone? She was only afraid of dying all alone. When did you last see her? Well, the day before yesterday, in the morning. Are you sure it wasn't yesterday morning? Yesterday morning I was ill and stayed in bed. Well, what was the matter with you? I'd been out of dope for two days. Wouldn't she give you any? She swore she hadn't any. And you haven't been back there since? No. Now, listen, the Countess's body was found yesterday afternoon about five o'clock. The evening papers were out already, so the news didn't appear till this morning. But you spent the night looking for money so you could get away from Paris. How did you know the Countess was dead? Well, I went along her street and saw a crowd on the pavement. What time was that? About half past six. Yeah, you thought she'd be suspected, did you, when you heard she'd been strangled? <laughs> It's always like that. So you decided to go away. Who gave you the money? A friend. A man. Well, who? I don't know his name. Look, you'd better tell me. I don't know. All right. Tell me to your own way. The new car. Yes, sir. Look, take this fellow out of the confessional and keep him there until he decides to come clean. Look, I don't care whether it takes 24 hours or three days. Well, you're tired, hand over to someone else. Right. This way. But I've told you all I know. Come on. This isn't fair. I can't tell you what I've known. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Lapointe. There's an old girl in black sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, what about her? She's our let's aunt. Hmm? Saw a report of her murder in the papers and came straight here from Monsieur this morning. Uh. She's... She's identified our let. Wants, wants to have a word with you. Oh, I see. Well, let's hope it doesn't take too long. I want my lunch. You'd better show it. Right, sir. Will you come this way, please, madame? Well, thank you. Chief Inspector Maigret? Mm -hmm. Yes, madame. Uh, please take a seat. Uh, thank you. I believe you've identified the body. Indeed, I have. I'm afraid there is no doubt it is the remains of my poor, unfortunate brother's child. He died, you know, when she was two years old. No, I didn't know. Now, your sister-in-law lives in Lisieux. Never left the place. Do you but... think she will have seen the newspaper with her daughter's photograph in it? Undoubtedly. The photograph was on the front page. Well, don't you find it strange that she's not got in touch with it? Not in the least. She would certainly not do so. She's too proud. Mm. In fact, I'm convinced that if she were confronted with the body, she would swear it was not her daughter. I know she has heard nothing from the girl for the last four years. Mm, yes. I would say nobody could live under the same roof as my sister-in-law. But there was another reason. A woman in whom I have every confidence and who goes once a week to Caen, where she is part owner of a shop, swore to me on her husband's life that not long before my niece left home, she met her at Caen, just going into a doctor's house. Yes. And not just an ordinary doctor, Chief Inspector, a gynecologist. Uh, in other words, you suspect your niece of having left the town because she was pregnant? Frankly, yes. Mm. Earlier that year, I remember, my sister-in-law decided to take her to La Bouboule for a holiday. Yeah. She left Lisieux for good three or four months later. And she couldn't have been more than three or four months pregnant then because it didn't show. Well, that exactly fits in with her visit to La Bouboule. Mm. And I'm perfectly certain it was there that she met the man by whom she became pregnant. And she most likely went off to join him. If it had been a Lisieux man, he would have either arranged for an abortion or gone away with her. Yes, I see. Well, thank you for coming to see us, madame. You're going back to Lisieux, I suppose. Oh, no, not today. I have friends in Paris, and I shall probably spend a few days with them. Yeah. Now, don't hesitate to ring, Inspector, if you need me. Oh, thank you. I shall always be ready to help. Yes, I'm sure you will. Good day. Good day, Chief Inspector. Oh. Inspector? Hmm? Now, oh, look, you're not going to let me get any lunch, are you, Lapointe? I was looking forward to a nice cold beer. I've just been on the phone to Nice. Uh -huh. They found the report on von Farnheim's death? Yes. Nothing obviously suspicious, but they give me the names of the servants who were employed at the house, which you may find interesting. Huh? Uh, now, there were five of them. Antoinette Meja, age 19, housemaid. Rosalie Moncoeur, 42, cook. Maria Pinaco, 23, kitchen maid. Angelino Lupin, 38, butler. And Oscar Bonvoisin. 35. Valet chauffeur. Oscar, at last. Hmm. I suppose nobody knows what's become of all these people. Well, oh, the police at Nice have found an employment bureau which specialises in staffing big houses. It's kept by an old lady who's been there for over 20 years. 
She doesn't remember Count von Farnheim or the Countess or Oscar Bonvoisin. But not more than a year ago, she found a job for Rosalie Moncoeur, the cook. It's with some South Americans in Paris. Uh, now, I had their address. Yeah. 132 Avenue Diena. Anything known about the others? Well, they're following that up. Shall I go and see her, sir? Mm, no, sorry, La Pointe. I think it's better if I go. Yes, sir. Get myself that beer on the way. I'm sorry to have to ask you into the kitchen, but we have a lunch party in half an hour to prepare for. No, not at all. It's very kind of you to see me, Madame Moncur. I'll try not to take up too much of your time. Now, I believe you once worked for the Count and Countess von Farnheim in the south of France. You don't mean to tell me you're digging up that old story. Not exactly. Did you know the Countess was dead? It happens to everyone. No, I didn't know. She was murdered. Who killed her? Well, we don't know yet. That's what I'm trying to find out. Do you remember an Oscar Bonvoisin who worked with you for the Von Farnheims? Him? <laughs> oh, yes. You didn't like him? He was a valet. I don't like valets. They're all bone idle, especially when their chauffeurs as well believe they're cock of the walk. You think he may have killed the Countess? Oh, that's possible. Can you give me a description of him? As he was in those days, yes. But I don't know what he looks like now. At least... Uh, yes? A few weeks ago, I went to see my brother in Montmartre. He has a cafe in the Rue Coulancourt. On my way there, I passed a man in the street I thought I knew. Uh, he looked at me, too, as if he was trying to place me, and then suddenly he began to walk very fast, turning his head away. And you thought it was Oscar? I'd almost swear it was. Hmm. Tell me, what kind of a man was he? I don't like giving people away. You'd rather let a murderer go free? If he's only killed the Countess, he's done no great harm. Look, if he has killed her, he's killed at least one other woman. And there's no reason to suppose that he'll stop there. He wasn't tall. Rather on the small side. He used to wear high heels to make himself look taller. I used to tease him about it. He was very dark. Very thick hair. Black eyebrows. Some women thought him irresistible. Not me. Anyhow, he had all the women he wanted. And not only the servants. No, you think he had an affair with the Countess? Before the Count had been dead two days. Uh, how do you know? Because I saw him come out of her room at six in the morning. That was partly why I left. And when the servants begin to share the best bedroom, that's it. Did it ever occur to you that the Count might have been murdered? It was none of my business. But it did occur to you? It occurred to the police, too, didn't it? Else why did they ask all those questions? Could it have been Oscar? I don't say that. She was probably just as capable of doing it herself. How was she killed? Strangled. And who was the other woman? A girl, 20 years old, came from Lisieux. Nothing to suggest she ever lived on the Riviera. All we know is that she once visited La Bourboule. In the Auvergne? Yes. Oscar came from the Auvergne. Did he, indeed? I don't know exactly what part, but he had a bit of an accent. Mm. Had he changed much when you saw him a few weeks ago? He was fatter, and his hair was beginning to go grey at the temple, but I'm sure it was him. Anything else? He was very smartly dressed, I remember that. Look at the time. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, but I need the kitchen to myself. Of course, Madame Monker, I understand. And thank you. Uh, Le point. Yes, sir. Is Luca still in the confessional with Philippe? Yes. Well, get him in here. Yes, sir. jean -Vier. Yes, sir. Get on to the press. Tell them we've questioned Philippe Mortemar for several hours with no result. And uh, that chap's like a wet rag, hmm? but I've got nothing out of him so far. Sorry, Chief. We're letting him go. What? No. <laughs> If Oscar Bonvoisin did kill those two women, we'll get him eventually, but it'll take time. And before we catch him, he may bump off someone else for knowing too much. And you think we could use Philippe as bait? Because if he does know something, which I'm convinced he does, Oscar must be feeling very uneasy. A drug addict can't be trusted. 
Philippe said nothing yet, but that doesn't mean he'll keep quiet forever. And Oscar knows it. And if the press publishes the fact that we've released him, Oscar may try to get rid of him. Exactly. But I realise there's the risk we may be landed with another corpse, but I intend that we keep a very close eye on the boy. He must be needing dope badly by now, and Oscar may be his only means of getting it. We'll let him go at dusk. It'll be easier to tail him then. Now, Luca, La Pointe, uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, right. Oh, and get Longyon and some of his men on it, too. Yes. He's always saying how well he knows Montmartre. Now's his chance to prove it. <laughs> I'm off to Picratz. This whole business started there, and I have the feeling it may well end there. If anything turns up, phone me. Evening, Chief Inspector. Evening. Thought you might come in. What the hell, Randy? Oh, thank you. Is your wife not here? Yeah, yeah, she's upstairs. Giving a lesson to the girl who's replacing Arlette. Hmm, doesn't it interest you? Uh, she's quite pretty. Yeah, good health. Oh, thank you. A better figure than Arlette, but uh, it's not the same thing. At least she's alive. Yeah. Uh, you were asking before about a fellow named Oscar. Yes. Well, I don't know how to explain it properly, and I don't know if there is such a person, but what I do know is that there was somebody... I had old over her. What sort of old and why, I don't know. But if there was somebody, do you suppose she suddenly got sick of him and decided to give him away? Well, when she went to the police station, she knew a crime was to be committed and that it involved a countess. Yeah, but why did she pretend she'd found it out here, listening to a conversation between these two men? To begin with, she was drunk. Perhaps she drank to screw up her courage. Perhaps young Elber had more effect on her than he realised. Oh, by the way, I've discovered... He's one of your fellas. Yes, I didn't realise it was La Pointe who was with her until he told me. He wasn't on duty. No, he was genuinely in love with her, you know. Yeah, but I did tell you. He wanted her to change her way of life. Wanted to marry her. Poor La Pointe. Excuse me. No, that may be for me. Big rats. Yeah, he is. You were right. It's for you. Oh, thanks. Uh, yes. Look out here, Chief. Hmm? I'm in the Rue Le Pique. When Philippe Mortimer left headquarters, he came straight here to the cafe on the corner. He's been round all the tables asking for someone called Bernard. Uh, who's Bernard? Drug pusher. No luck, though. He left a few minutes ago. La Pointe's tailing him. Fine. Thanks, Luca. Hey, it's all right if Rose and a girl run over the act down here, Chief Inspector. Huh? Oh, well, yes, yes, of course. Good. You might even enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Remember what I told you? You come in through there. Now, now, wait a minute, dear. There's a fanfare first. I'll put the record on. Now. Oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> Rose knows how to teach the girls what to do. But this one... <laughs> Never be a patch on all that. Yeah. Now the shoulder strap. No, slowly. You'll never last the music out of me as fast as that. Right. Now go right around the floor. Mm, shall I? Yeah, that'll be for you. Uh, me, Graham. The plant here, sir. He's got as far as the cafe in the Place Constantin Pecqueur. Uh, what's he doing? Still seems to be looking for someone. Uh, nobody following him? Nobody, except us. Just take it That's off. That's Inspector Lognon and myself. Uh, where's Lognon? Over the road, outside the cafe. Well, ask him to have a word with the cafe proprietor. Uh, Not in front of the customers, if he can help it. Uh, tell him to ask if he knows Oscar Bonvoisin. And tell him to ring me as soon as he's done it. Right, sir. With her. Well, how's it going, Monsieur Maigret? Mm, slowly. Maigret. Longion here. The cafe proprietor knew Oscar and where he lives. Oh, where? A house called Chez Manier, Rue Coulancourt. Uh, what's Philippe up to? 
getting very drunk at the moment. Right. Get one of your men to keep an eye on him, collect La Pointe, and I'll meet you both outside Chez Manier in five minutes. Right, Chief Inspector. In the bag. Perhaps. Well, you'll come back here when it's over, won't you? We'll have a bottle of champagne. Celebrate. Where's La Pointe? Checking if there's a way out of the back. Mm. But I doubt there will be. Right. As soon as he gets back, we're going in there. There's no one upstairs, Chief. Oh. Shall we warn the railway station? Well, judging by the fire in the stove, I'd say Oscar left here three or four hours ago. Uh, he meant to make a run for it. He'll be away by now. He had plenty of trains to choose from. He could be waiting for Philippe somewhere. That's more than possible. Have you got Philippe's address? Yes, uh, Boulevard Rochechoir. Right, Longyo, you keep an eye on this place from the other side of the road. Keep out of sight. You think Oscar will come back? I don't think anything. All I know is that the Countess was killed in her own flat, and so was Arlette. If Oscar was responsible for those two murders, and he wants to silence Philippe, he could well be waiting at the Boulevard Rochechoir. Right, Lapointe, you come with me. Chief. Well, La Pointe, what did the concierge say? Philippe's room is on the first floor. Door on the left. She didn't think he'd come in yet. Uh, hardly surprising if he's getting drunk in a cafe in the Place Constantin Pecqueur. Any other inquiries for him? Not as far as she knew, but she hadn't been in for very long. So, she wouldn't know if anyone else had gone up to his room. Got your gun, La Pointe? Well, yes, sir, but, but I... Right, come on. Let's go up. Quietly, right. There's someone moving about in there. Yes. In. Shh. Ah, Monsieur Bonvoisin. I am Chief Inspector Major. Take him apart! I've killed him. Let's have a look. I, I, I've killed him. Your first, is it? I don't forget, he killed our leg. It... It is him. Oscar Bonvoisin? Yes, that's him. Description fits perfectly. I'm sorry, sir. I think I'm going to be sick. No, you're not, young Lapointe. What you're going to do is to go and ring up headquarters, and after that, if you can find a bistro that's still open, you're going to have a large drink. Oh, but I... I... And that's an order. And that Georges was when young Lapointe, as I've always called him, grew up. Yes, I remember it all now. Oh, but did you ever get your free bottle of champagne, that Picratz? Oh, yes. <laughs> that night, I took La Pointe back there after all the details had been cleared up. What was the new girl's act like? Terrible. <laughs> Fred left all the lights on at the end. She had to scuffle off as best she could, not to mm. stitch on. <laughs> did he do it on purpose? Yeah, probably. It got a laugh from some of the clientele. Then I looked at La Pointe, and he was crying. He'd buried his first love and killed his first man. Who's to blame him? He got very drunk. With a little help from usual. Perhaps. So I took him to his rooms, put him to bed. You're a very thoughtful man. Well, not really. I completely forgot to send someone to tell Longyon he could go home. 
He was still there under the trees opposite Oscar's house when I drove to work the next morning. <laughs> he caught a terrible cold. Poor Lognon. Poor La Pointe. In Maigret in Montmartre by Georges Simenon, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simenon. Luca was Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, and Janvier, Sean Barrett. Inspector Lognon, Garrard Green, Fred Alfonsi, Hayden Jones, Rose, Maddie Head, and Philippe, Michael Burlington. Other parts were played by Catherine Parr, Nicolette McKenzie, Kathleen Helm, and Peter Craze. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. Murder in Capitals, 1971 they say in this section we monitor all French and Italian newspapers for items of possible use to the Foreign Office. It's a low classification security-wise, so I cannot see how this awful affair can be connected with the work here. Murder in Capitals by Bernard Picton The play is set in a room of the translation unit of the Foreign Office in London. Murder in Capitals Morning, Miss Mason. Hello, Briggs. All set for another week on the treadmill? <laughs> no. I've got that Monday morning feeling, I'm afraid. <laughs> Ooh, the thought of all those damn papers on my desk. Oh, you better not tell me about it, Miss. I might be a spy, you know. Yes. Well, I suppose you want to see my pass? Uh, you know the regulations, Miss Mason. Oh, hang on. My handbag seems to collect more junk every day. It does seem a bit daft, I admit. I mean... I've seen you come into this building almost every morning for three years. Ah, here we are. Ah, oh, thank you. Oh, good morning, Miss Osborne. Morning. Here's my pass already. Hello, Nina. Hi, Jean. Hey, look, there's a lift. Come on, quick. Oh. oh have a good weekend, Nina. Mmm, super. Met a chap at Sheila's. Tall, dark, handsome, and a Mercedes. How'd you get on? Oh, the usual. Went down to Sussex to Mummy and Daddy. Roger took me to a bit of a party at the country club on Saturday. This place must be a bit of a drag after that. Not really. I love it. It's worthwhile. What? Looking through lousy old continental newspapers day after day? Well, someone has to do it. Anyway, we found quite a few bits lately that were useful to the intelligence people. And it's a stepping stone to more important work. Well, I just do it for the money, sweetie. Oh, carbolic. Smells more like an operating theatre than a clothes room. <laughs> Come on, darling. Hang your things up and be grateful you're allowed to serve Queen and country. I wish the Queen would give us decent lockers, then. Hello, Paula. How's Muscle Hill? Hello, Lena. Hi, Jean. Have a good weekend, Paula. So-so. Oh, Nothing out of the ordinary. Oh, well, better go in and face the men, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Old Evans will have a backache from gardening, and Gabriel oh, will God. give us a punch-by-punch -punch account of his Lady <laughs> Sam Moors, as usual. Well, I'll go and pick up the post first. Good morning, Mr. Evans. How's things? Uh, a shocking back, Miss Mason. That damn garden. Morning. Uh, morning, Miss Osborne. Where's Gabriel? No sign of him, as usual. When I was a junior in the embassy service, it was more than our job was worth to arrive after the boss. Ah, but we're all linguistic geniuses here, Mr. Evans. You've got to allow us some artistic license. Fluency in a couple of languages doesn't excuse sloppy behaviour, Miss Mason. Mr. Ross pushes things a bit too far. Oh, the devil himself. What's that? Who's the devil? And good morning, all. Morning, Gabriel. Afternoon, almost. 9.20 on the dot. Parking the car, that's where the time goes. The car that gives you lazy devils a lift every evening, I might add. And how many conquests over the weekend, Gabriel? Oh, don't start that all over again this week, love, though, as it happens. Post, everybody. Oh. Yeah. Hello, Gabriel. Mr. Evans. No. Letter for you, Lena. Uh, Thank you, darling. A couple for you, Jean. Thank you. The rest's all official stuff. 
Do you want me to open no, it? No, 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 I'll see to it. Some of it's um, classified. Don't you trust a howl? Mind you, I did notice a hammer and sickle embroidered on her petticoat the other day. Gabriel. You have a most <laughs> peculiar sense of humour. Well, hey, listen, everyone. I had a letter from the appointments board in the F.O. I had to go on Friday for an interview for that job in Department M8. That senior translator vacancy? I didn't know you'd applied, Miss Osborne. I told you, Mr. Evans, weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't anyone going to say jolly good? A jolly good? Um, well, as it happens, Jean, my letter says the same thing. Well, you cagey old thing. You didn't let on. Jean. Yes, Paula. I had my letter at home on Saturday. Meow, meow, sharp enough your claws, girl. So you're both after it. Well, we've all got on as an Italian and French love, so what's the surprise? I could do with the money, I can tell you. What about you, Gabriel? You're a French and Italian wizard like the rest of us. Ah, that would be telling. Oh, swine, come on, tell us. Sweat on it, darling. Hey, Jean, what's the matter? Oh, nothing, nothing. What's wrong? God, you're as white as a sheet. Are you all right, Jean? Is it that that other letter? I'll be okay. Some upsetting news, that's all. Anything we can do, Olga? No, no thanks. Excuse me, just for a minute. I say, do you think she's all right? She looked terrible. Better go after her, I think. Oh, well. I wonder what was in that note. Our elegant colleague was certainly shaken rigid by it. Suppose we try getting on with a little work for a change. Miss Simpson will look after her. Jean, you all right? I thought you were going to pass out in the office. Oh, I'll be fine. Really, I will, Paula. I just wanted to be quiet for a minute. Well, I don't want to poke my nose in where it's not wanted, but if there's anything I can do... Is it some family trouble? Someone, someone ill? No, no, nothing like that. It, it's nothing. Well, funny sort of nothing to affect you like this. Well, you're normally our Miss Iceberg, all calm and efficient. Please, Paula, leave me alone. It's nothing to do with the job, is it? This is a queer old place, security and all that. Oh, no, not exactly. Oh, come on, Jeannie. It'll be better off your chest. Oh, Paula, it... I think I'm being blackmailed. You think you are? But look at this. This is what came in the post. Just one word. Francini. Yes. Big capital letters. Cut from the magazine and and stuck on plain paper. But what on earth does it mean? How can one word be blackmail? I might as well tell you the whole story now that I've started. But please promise to keep it yourself. Of course, if that's what you want. Well, about five years ago, after I took my degree, I went for a year to Turin, to the university, to get some real practice in Italian. When I was there, I used to go to all sorts of student meetings. A friend took me a few times to some very left-wing affairs, organised by a way-out character called Francini. Of course, I remember reading about him not long ago. But I I thought they'd locked him up. They have. His activities got a bit too near the bone for the authorities. Somehow, somebody's found out that I went to his meetings. Oh, but you weren't serious about it, Jean. Or his bright red politics, I mean. It happens now. But I was curious about all sorts of student activities. His brand of speech-making was jolly good practice for the language. Mm. But it wouldn't look too good on your security record. What did you tell them when you were recruited? I didn't say anything. I felt a bit guilty, but... What was the point of killing my chances when it meant nothing? So I kept quiet. Oh, security blow a fuse if they found out. Don't rub it in, Paula. That's why this letter's so sinister. Someone knows. What does he hope to gain? He or she? Oh, I don't know. Money's the obvious thing with blackmail. Or with your parents, he could make a packet if it came to cash. Oh, I suppose so. But could it be some sort of espionage approach? Could be. Although, let's face it, our job is hardly James Bond style. Not digging through foreign newspapers every day. Well, I'm afraid, Paula. It doesn't seem like a practical joke. Even Gabriel wouldn't pull a stupid thing like this. Mm. What about the envelope? Oh, nothing there, look. The address has been printed with some sort of rubber stamp. Mm, like those printing sets that kids have. Um, there's a central London postmark, which doesn't help. What can he want? Just one word. 
If he's serious, there'll be other letters after this. Jean... Jean, you must tell the police. I can't. They go straight to security. I can't risk it. You know how much this job means to me. Especially now, with this chance of promotion coming up. So what are you going to do? Nothing. What else can I do? Perhaps it was a sick joke, and that's the last I'll hear of it. Well, you'd better go back and do some work. I feel a bit calmer now. Is all right. Dated the 16th. Nearly 20 past five, comrades. Time to shut the shop. Your appreciation of time seems more acute in the evening, Gabriel, than it does at the start of the day. You wouldn't get to Waterloo in time for the 5.50 every night if I wasn't quick off the mark with the old car, Howell, old boy, so don't bellyache too much. Yes, and we're one short for a lift tonight, too. Yes, where the devil is Paula? First Jean goes off at lunchtime with the abdabs and a headache after a mysterious damn letter. Now Paula's vanished. Well, she's probably slipped off to Jean's flat on her way home to see how she is. Of course, nobody thinks to ask me. I'm only in charge of this office. No, no, don't get all paranoid, boss. Come on, let's go. I'll I'll give part of my nose, Gabriel, and get my coat. I'll see you in the corridor. (laughs) You'd think that I was the general dog spot. Now, that lift is out of action more often than it's working. Well, the exercise will do you good, sweetie. Mm. Uh, get rid of that threatened spare tire. Oh, yes. Hey, well, hang on a minute. No, mm. what's wrong? Left my blasted car keys in my desk. Oh. Uh, I'll have to slip upstairs again. Oh, Gabriel, you are the limit. Well, you, Jiffy. Wait for me in the foyer, will you? No, everything seems to have gone completely crazy today, Miss Mason. I do hate continuous disturbances. Well, it's been that sort of day, hasn't it? Ever since the mail came. Oh, and all of us supplying for that job in M8. I suppose Gabriel has, though, of course, he won't let on. What about you? Are you in the running for it, too? <laughs> no, too old by far, on the shelf. No, they want bright young things these days with college degrees, not somebody who's come up the hard way. No offence, Miss Mason, but it does leave a nasty taste in the mouth to be passed over time and time again. Oh, here's Gabriel. Sorry about that. Oh, come on, it's getting late. Right. Oh, 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 Lena, Lena. Miss Mason. Oh, oh, Lena, you're all right. Well, let me see. You see, damn shoes. Right. I slipped. It's yeah. my arm. Yeah, let's let's let me help you out. Pull my arm. That's it. You're bleeding. Let's see that hand. Oh, I hit it against the wall. Oh, let's get the commission there. Right. Briggs! Briggs! Come here. Oh, bless my soul. Oh, Miss Mason, what's happened? She slipped and cut her wrist. Have you got a bandage or something to put on it? Let's have a look, miss. Oh, it's a nasty graze. Lucky it's not deep. Uh, come over to the desk, miss. I, I've got some adhesive dressings oh, thank there. thank you, Briggs. I can't stand blood. Oh, makes me feel quite sick. Oh, come on. We'd better get a move on or we'll miss the train. It's 5.40 now. Evening, Briggs. Oh, evening, Miss Osborne. Well, I thought you went home early. You're not feeling very well. Oh, a bit of urgent work to clear up. I suppose I've still got to show this silly pass. Who oh, was on duty? Well, I should have finished at six, Miss, but the um, the night guard is visiting his missus in hospital, so uh, I said I'd stay on late. Is that clock right? Well, it's a couple of minutes fast. Uh, it's just on ten to eight. I'm expecting a phone call at eight. There is someone on the switchboard at this time of the evening. Yes, miss. Uh, it's always got one operator on at night. Right. I won't be upstairs very long. Uh, OK, miss. Hello, Commissioner's desk. Miss Osborne here, Briggs. No one's rung through to you asking if I'm in, have they? Uh, no, miss. Not a soul. It's nearly half past eight. I was expecting that call long ago. Uh, shall I ring the main foreign office exchange? It, it may have gone through to the Whitehall number. Oh, no. No, don't bother, thanks. It was a personal call, not business. I'll be down in a minute. I can't wait much longer. Bye. Bye. Oh, God. Come on, if you're going to ring. North past. Oh, to hell with him. And Chini or not. Morning, peasants. What news from the front? Oh, for God's sake, Gabriel. Can't you say something different for a change? Oh, touch it this morning, sweetie. We've had that peasant routine every morning for two and a half years, dear. And don't call me sweetie. Full of the joys this morning, aren't we? I don't want to pull my rank, Mr. Ross, but I am some 15 years ahead in seniority, and I would prefer to be called something other than a peasant each day. 
You're very late, by the way. It's nearly ten o'clock. A spot of ignition trouble. The wet weather, you know, plays hell with these high-performance jobs. That's probably what's wrong with you, Lena, my love. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Where's Miss Simpson? Really, this place is going from bad to worse. Well, she she came to see you last night, didn't she, Jean? Who, Paula? Mm. Oh, hadn't seen her since I went home yesterday lunchtime. Well, she wasn't around at closing time, old girl. We thought she'd popped over to push aspirins down your throat. Uh, Typical. People come and go as they like these days. I'm afraid I'll have to have a word with Mr. Forth Brown. Well, uh, what's new on the continent this morning? Well, there's damn all happening in Paris. Um, how about dear old Italy, Jean? Sorry. Oh, mm. oh, the papers. Mm. No, no, nothing so far. I wonder where she's got to. Oh, well, Miss Simpson, of course. Not so much as a phone call. Perhaps she's not well. I mean, she could have phoned. Who's going to do her work? Oh, here, give me some of the stuff. I'll do it. Let's send some over here, Lena. Mm-hmm. Here we are, lover boy, Thank and some for El Supremo himself. Mm, it's yeah. all very well, but she should let us know. Then I could get somebody up from Moran section to help out. Moran section? Oh, God. Their French and Italian is about as good as my Hindustani. Oh, for goodness sake, let's get on with it. A nice cup of coffee would warm up the old brain cells nearly ten o'clock. Yeah, that's another thing. It was Miss Simpson's week to make the coffee. Most inconsiderate. Mm, I'll do it if it'll stop you all bickering. Anyone seen the electric kettle? Mm, yeah, yes, try that cupboard there. No, no, it's not there. Uh, probably in her locker in the cloakroom. Paula hoards everything in there like a bloody magpie. Mr. Ross Language, please. Oh, it sorry. won't be there, love. Ask Betty next door. They've probably borrowed it, or, or they can lend us theirs. Yes, you try them. They don't have their elevenses until 11. <laughs> well, try the locker first. I don't know. Oh, here we are, lover boy. Have a look at this. Have you got this cupboard in your Italian paper? No, nothing What, this story? It's not that. It's got a lot of coverage in this. Surprise. Captain Barrett. What the hell's happened? What in heaven's name? It's Jean! God. Miss Osborne, what? Oh, Oh. my God. Oh, Oh. Oh. it's Paula. Is she dead? Jean, come out. Look at the blood. Oh, God, I think I'm going to be sick. Uh, Evans, uh, Harold Evans. I'm the senior member of this section. And I'm Chief Superintendent Benbow. This is my colleague, Inspector Ellis. Morning, sir. Uh, How do you do? I understand that you're special branch officers, not uh, detectives, hmm? That's so, Mr. Evans. Your director spoke to the undersecretary and recommended that this affair be treated as a security matter for the time being. Oh, seems highly unlikely, Superintendent, but then the whole dreadful business seems incredible. Uh, Well, we'll try to let some daylight into it, sir, shall we? Uh, I'd like a preliminary word with you before we see the rest of the staff. Of course. This is the main office, is it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the girls have a cloakroom through there, where it happened. What's the room where the others are waiting? Oh, that belongs to the German section next door. The director told me to use it until further notice. And what exactly do you do in here? We uh, monitor all the French and Italian newspapers for items of possible use to the foreign office. It's uh, a low classification security-wise, so I can't see this awful affair being connected with work. We will have to see. There are... Uh, there were... Five of you in here. Uh, yes, that's right. Three girls, another man, and myself. And the dead girl, Pauline Simpson, being one of them. Yes, that's terrible, terrible. Such a nice, quiet person. In fact, the nicest in the office. What's wrong with the others? Oh, I, I didn't mean that, Superintendent. They're all pleasant enough, as young people go these days. But the other two girls, well, one is, uh, how shall I put it, rather flamboyant. And the other? Oh, very nice, very nice, but perhaps a little, well, superior, you might say. A snob, you mean? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't put it as strongly as that. And the man, what's his name, Gabriel Ross? Oh, again, a bit um, high-spirited with it, I think they call it these days, but easy to get along with. Yes, well, I think we'll have to have a look at them for ourselves in a moment. Would you mind joining them in the other room, Mr. Evans? We'll want to talk to you later. Uh, Very well. Yes, uh, terrible business, awful life. Don't know what's going to happen to the worker. I must uh, see the director. Excuse me. Miserable old devil, isn't he? <laughs> More like something out of Dickens than the Foreign Office. That's what the Civil Service does to you, Ellis. Come on, <laughs> yes, sir. let's have another look at the scene. Pathologists should be here in a minute. You've got a plain clothes man out in the corridor? Yes, sir. Thompson. I've kept the CID out of it so far. Yes. It's years since I saw a murder. Keep your feet away from that blood. I remember that much. Oh, sorry. Mm. 
She's stone cold, Super, and as stiff as a board. Been dead a long time, certainly. Is that her handbag against the wall? Mm, yeah, it looks like it. Well, the stuff inside is tipped out. Shall I collect it together? Yes, may as well. In a difficult position from the security angle. Are we to have a gang of police photographers trampling all over the place? Well, she's already fallen out of the locker onto the floor. I can't see much point her. Mm. Well, here's the stuff. Haven't smeared any prints, don't worry. Yes, the usual junk. Purse, makeup, yes. letters. What the hell is this? Page torn from a magazine with big holes cut out of it. <laughs> well, knowing my wife's habits, I wouldn't be surprised at anything a woman carries in a bag. Hello. The chap outside told me to come on in. I'm Dr. Lambton, the pathologist. Hello, Doctor. I'm Ben Moe. I had a couple of cases with you years ago when I was at West End Central. You wouldn't remember me. This is Inspector Ellis. How do you do? Good morning, Doctor. This is a bit out of a line in Special Branch, I'm afraid. Uh, Help yourself. There she is. Ah. Poor girl. Quite young. Yes. 24. Translator in this place. Last seen sometime yesterday afternoon. No one seems to know exactly when. Yeah. Yeah. Died yesterday, no doubt of that. Nasty wound in the chest, right through the blouse. Yeah. Odd shape wound. Seems almost double. Any sign of a weapon? Not so far, but you haven't long arrived. Ellis, have a good look round, will you? Well, not much to look at. Only these lockers and the loose. Yes, well, do your best. Yes, yes sir. See this, Superintendent. Hmm? When I just move the torn blouse aside, <coughs> you can see the shape of the wound. I'm pretty sure I know the cause of that. That's rather a ragged hole. A pair of scissors would fit the bill quite well. Yes. Would there be much blood at the time? Oh, not necessarily. Uh, depend on what damage has been done internally. See, yes. there's a lot of blood on the floor of the locker. Yes, so I see. Oh, but that could be due to a slow ooze overnight. Super, look at this, sir. Here in the toilet. Huh? Come on, Lucky. What is it, Ellis? Well, in the system of the WC, I lifted the top off, and there they were. A pair of scissors. No, don't touch it. Let the lab people get it out. Hmm. Part of it is underwater, but one blade is above the surface. Would that be the sort of thing, Doctor? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. Two sharp points, uh, the whole thing about six inches long. And look, there's still blood on that one blade. Fair enough. Well, we won't tramp around oh. here anymore. Uh, can we leave you to liaise with the yard lab, Doctor? They're on their way. We rang them some time ago. Oh, right, right. I'll have a closer look at the body and then do a post-mortem uh, as soon as I can get it shifted to the mortuary. Fine. Well, we'll go and tackle the office staff. Come on, Ellis. Uh, please sit down, Miss Osborne. Now, I want to get a quick picture of what happened here yesterday. Oh, it's horrible. Is it really true that Paula was deliberately killed? I'm afraid it is. Now, what were your movements yesterday afternoon? Oh, I can't really help you. You see, I went home at lunchtime with a bad migraine, so I've no idea what went on here after that. Yes, so well, that certainly seems to cut you out of the picture, so there is nothing out of the ordinary so far as you were concerned. No, no, hmm. there wasn't. You don't seem very sure. Well, it's nothing to do with this, but... Uh, I had some upsetting personal news in the morning, and that was what brought on my head, actually. You can't think of any reason for Miss Simpson to be attacked? Heavens, no. She was a sweet girl. You must have been a maniac. Thank you. Well, perhaps you'll wait next door for a while. I'll have to speak to you all again later on. Superintendent. (coughs) Yes? I suppose I'd better tell you. Hmm? Rather than you find out and think it odd. Find out what, Miss Osborne? I came back here late last night for about half an hour. Oh. Well, uh, tell me about it, please. I was expecting a phone call, a private one, at 8 o'clock. But it didn't come, so I went home about 8.30. Haven't you a phone at home? I suppose it'll all have to come out now. It's rather a complicated story. Yes, well, a policeman's job is to listen to complicated stories. Uh, I'm busy, Ellis. Sorry, but this is important, sir. Can you come through here a moment? Excuse me for a minute, Miss Osborne. Yes, what the hell is it, man? That girl suddenly tells me she came back here late last night. This is about her, too. I was looking through the other lockers and found these in the one marked J. Osborne. Well? Shoes, flatties, my wife calls them. Now look closely at the toe cups and uppers, sir. Yes, I see what you mean. Look like blood spots, sir. 
Has the pathologist gone yet? Yes, sir, just now. We followed the body out. And get these shoes over to the lab right away. No doubt, I suppose, they belong to Miss Osborne. They were in the bottom of her locker. Right. Well, this makes a further word with her all the more important. Miss Osborne, um, do you keep a pair of flat-heeled shoes in your locker? What an extraordinary question. Yes, I do as it happens. I sometimes wear them for work. They're easier on the feet than street shoes. Why? We'll leave that for the moment and go back to last night's visit. Well, yesterday morning, I had this letter. It seemed Mm. to be a blackmail note. Just one word made up from capital letters stuck on the paper. One word? Yes, Francini. The name of an Italian left-wing at his meetings years ago when I was in university in Turin. It was quite innocent. But someone had found out. Then how was it blackmail? You know better than I do how keen they are here on security clearance for employees. This was so trivial, I hadn't mentioned it at interviews. Keeping quiet about it makes it look worse now, I suppose. Especially as I'm in for a new job with a higher security rating. You think someone is threatening to put the screw on you by exposing your dark past? They seem to have succeeded, don't they? But what has this to do with coming back here late last night? Well, I had a telegram late in the afternoon saying there would be a phone call at 8 o'clock at the office. It was signed F, so I realised it was something to do with the letter in the morning. But there was no such call? No. I waited until half past eight, but nothing came. Well, Ellis, did you fix it? Thompson has taken the articles over to the lab, sir. Mm, right. Uh, now, Miss Osborne, where were we? Oh, have you got that letter and telegram with you? Oh, yes. Yes, in my bag. Here. Here they are. Yes. Just one word, Francini, as you said. Uh, those capital letters, sir. Surely they must that magazine we found in the dead girl's bag. You're right. Miss Osborne, did you know where these pasted letters came from? I don't know what you mean. You didn't by chance see a cut-up magazine page in Miss Simpson's handbag and put two and two together? You mean you think Paula wrote the letter? That's nonsense. Is it? Someone had to send it? Oh, no, it's ridiculous. I knew her better than anyone. She'd applied for the job, it's true, but so had Lena. And Gabriel, too, I suspect. So there was rivalry in the office over promotion? Hardly rivalry. All those qualified put in applications. But you stood the best chance? I wouldn't say that. I had the longest experience, but... I put it to you that you saw the damaged page in Miss Simpson's handbag and assumed that she was the blackmailer. That's nonsense. Miss Osborne, those shoes that I asked you about, I have to tell you that there were blood spots on the toe caps. Can you explain that? I don't believe it. Could there be? Well, that's for you to say. Perhaps when you discovered that Paula Simpson was the writer of that letter, you quarreled and became violent, and then you stabbed her with those scissors. Well, that's a terrible thing to say. How dare you? I, I won't listen to this. Now, sit down. You must realize that you're in a very difficult position. I think I'd better advise you before you go any further. You're entitled to legal advice. I want to phone my father. Very well. You can go with Inspector Ellis into another office. I'll see you again later when I've heard from the laboratory. This way, Miss Osborne. Well, let's have a smoke and see where we've got you, Ellis. Ah, have you checked the times Miss Osborne came and went last night? Yes, I got the commissioner to bring up the logbook. Mm. She came at 7.50 and left at 8.35, just as she said. If only the doctor could pin the time of death down a bit. Oh, it may be Lampton now. Hello? Superintendent Benbow. Ah, Dr. Lampton, any news for us? Well, I've finished the autopsy. Yeah. But there's nothing much new to tell you. Stab wound by a pair of scissors, consistent mm. with the size you found in the WC. Death due to penetration of the heart. I've got a few more things to check, but oh, that's about the strength of it. What about the time of death, Doctor? Can you get any closer? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, the temperature was the only thing to go on, uh, as usual. And it only tells us that it could have been anywhere in the six-hour bracket from three to nine o'clock yesterday. Damn. Oh, well, it's no use bl- blaming you, Doc. Uh, any other news from the forensic lab? No, I'm afraid not. Yes, it's difficult not working through the usual CID channels because of its security angle. Well, I had a word with one of the lab liaison officers. Yes? They've checked the blood group of the stains on the scissors and the shoes. It's group A, the same as the dead girl. Oh, thank God for something. I want to look at a few more angles in my own lab. Mm. I'll keep in touch. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> 
Well, that gets us exactly nowhere. Look, let's go and have a sandwich and a pint while the lab finish doing their magic spell. I just can't believe that she's a suspect, not Jean. We don't know that she is. Don't jump to conclusions. Then why is she being kept on her own in that office down the corridor? I mean, why isn't she with us? Ask Briggs here. He usually knows everything that's going on in this building. All right, Briggs. So what's happening? Uh, I'm not supposed to say anything. Oh, oh, come along. Very proper, too. Don't be such a stuffed shirt, Briggs. I mean, what was all that business with your time check book? Hmm. Well, they seemed very interested in knowing what time Miss Osborne came in and left last night. Last night? What? She was here last night. Well, when was she in? Well... Come on, you might as well tell us. Well, about eight o'clock, miss, uh, for half an hour or so. Extraordinary. What for, do you know? Waiting for the phone call, she said. Mm -hmm. Call it. Yeah, it never came. Uh, Look, sir, uh, I I shouldn't be talking about all this. But I... I just can't believe that Jean is under suspicion. I mean, it's all too damn silly. You know, she's always so much on her dignity... Do you know what I mean? No, I don't, Miss Mason. At least she always observes the conventions of seniority and protocol. Oh, for God's sake, you really are the end, Howard. Can't you try using Christian names? Ah, look here. There are only five in the office. Well, four now. And you still insist on this damsily fuss about seniority. Now, let's not begin that. Oh, no, no, please, please, please. Don't let's start arguing about that now. What about Jean? I mean, you don't seriously think she's a candidate for this ghastly affair, do you? Of course not. Then why on earth did she come back last night? Most irregular. There was no work to be done. So what's all this fairy story about a phone call? I mean, she's got a perfectly good phone in her own flat. And what was all that alarm and despondency in the morning over that mysterious letter? Mm, She's obviously mixed up in something queer. And then the the, the fuzz think it's an inside job. Or, I mean, we wouldn't be cooped up here, would we? amazing. I sincerely hope you're not suggesting that I may be under any sort of suspicion. Well, of course you are. The same as us, and why not? Well, I'm a well-established, trusted official. I mean, it would be preposterous. And anyway, what opportunity would I have had compared with you two? What the oh. devil do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I could hardly go into the ladies during working hours like Miss Osborne and Miss Mason here. Well, could I? charming. Oh. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. But nor could Gabriel here. No. Well, he conveniently forgot his car keys last night, didn't he? Oh. He had to come back up here alone. Look, are you suggesting... Look, I'm I... suggesting nothing, but I'm pointing out that whoever it was, it couldn't have been... Did Lambton say how long he'd be getting here? Well, he was leaving straight after he put the phone down. It's only a couple of minutes by car from the yard, love, to here. Well, the hell's a panic, I wonder. Mm. Well, the pathologist says there's a snag. Boy, there is a snag. Oh, what about the people in the other room, sir? Do you want to see them first? Uh, what about Miss Osborne? She's still sitting on her own across the corridor. Well, uh, they had anything to eat? Uh, yes, sir, yes, yes. Briggs, the commissionaire, ordered trays from the canteen. Well, let him wait until Dr. Lambton has told yes, us his sir. great news. It never hurts to let them stew a bit. Mm. Loosens up tongues and... Guilty consciences. Ah, oh, Dr. Lambton, come in. Give us this bad news. Yes, it is a bit off-putting, I must admit. Some of it is my work. The rest is from the yard. Well, tell us the worst. Well, you see, the lab were worried about those blood spots on the shoes when I called there with the specimens from the post-mortem. Mm. They asked me what I thought, and well, I had to agree that their doubts were justified. Weren't those spots blood, then? Oh, they were blood, all right. And they were the right group for the dead girl. But you see, the shape was all wrong. Shape? Yes. You see, when blood splashes obliquely, it forms shapes like exclamation marks with the sharp end facing the direction of travel. Oh, yes. And there's often a little separate blob in front, like the dot under the exclamation mark. Mm. So you can tell the direction from which the splashes came. Yes, that's right. And these were all wrong. They indicated that the blood came from the direction of the ankle. Which is impossible if the shoes are being worn. So what's the explanation? Well, the shoes were held in the hand, and blood deliberately flicked onto them from something held in the other hand. And if you're right, it means that this is a deliberate red herring to mislead us. Yes, someone trying to frame Miss Osborne. They were her shoes. Unless she did it herself, knowing it would be noticed. Oh, that's a bit far-fetched, isn't it? There's something else, something vitally important. Good or bad this time? Judge for yourself. It's a further bit of information after my autopsy. On close examination, I found a tiny shred of skin under the uh, dead girl's right index finger. It wasn't her own skin. How do you know? Different blood group. The victim was group A, and this was group O. I'm getting some other tests run on it, and they're going to ring the result through as soon as possible. What's the significance, then? Well, it could do for a defence attempt against the attacker. 
If poor Miss Simpson had a chance to scratch her assailant before she was stabbed, that shred of skin might belong to the killer. So we need someone with uh, blood group O. Yeah. Isn't that the most common one by far? Yeah, afraid so. About half the population. Mm. But at least <laughs> it excludes the other half. <laughs> And I'm hoping for more information soon that will narrow down the search a lot more. Yes, well, we can do with it. That first bombshell of yours about the shoes has shot the ground from under my feet as far as my best suspect goes. Ellis, wheel all those people back in here, will you? I want to confront them with this new twist. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is some vital new evidence concerning this tragic affair. It alters the whole complexion of the case. Now, has anyone anything to add or to alter to the statements they made earlier? No? You're all sure this may be the last chance to do it, if you remember something? All right, then. Uh, look here, Superintendent, I really don't see why you need me here. After all, I am in charge of this if station. you don't mind, Mr. Evans, I want everyone who had access to this office suite to be present. Oh, all right. Now, we have some you. vital facts concerning blood groups. And I must ask you all to give permission to have a blood sample taken. This is a bit much, officer. You're accusing one of us of murder, aren't you? Well, Mr. Ross, Miss Simpson didn't stab herself. I can't force anyone to have a blood test at this stage, but any refusal will be duly noted. Superintendent, can I say something that might help? What is it, Miss Osborne? Well, last year, we, we all gave blood at a donor session that was held in the canteen. So mm. all our blood groups must be on record somewhere. Mm. We were sent cards. Mm. Yes, quite right. I've got mine here in my wallet. Let's see. Just a minute. Yes, here we are. Look, there it is, Superintendent. Thank you, Miss Evans. <coughs> Dr. Lambton, is the... Are these okay? Well, they'll certainly help in a quick exclusion, though, of course, they'll have to be checked by the forensic sooner or later. Uh, what does Mr. Evans' card say? Group A. Oh, well, that seemed to let him out then. You see, the skin from the fingernail was O. Anyone else got their cards? Miss Osborne, you thought of the idea. Sorry, mine's at home. I think I'm Group A, but I c couldn't swear to it. Miss Mason? Mr. Ross. I can't remember any damn group. I've probably lost the card anyway. Miss Mason. Well, I don't remember either, and I certainly haven't got my card. Well, I didn't make it a rule, you know. Doctor, how best do we settle this business? Well, as I said, they'll have to give blood samples eventually. But if you want some quick information, why not telephone the registry here? They should have complete records of all blood donors in the building. Yes. Ellis, get cracking on that phone, will you? Yes, sir. Check Ross and Miss Mason. Yes, sir. Uh, while we're waiting... You can tell me, Mr. Ross, why you ran back upstairs at 5.30 last evening. How the devil did you know that? Well, the commissioner was chosen for his job, not least for his powers of observation. But I asked you a question. I left my car keys in my desk, that's all. I had to come back up for them. Well, that's something we'll never be able to prove one way or another, is it? Don't be so damned offensive. I don't have to prove it. Oh, uh, Sir? Sir, I've got the blood groups of Miss Mason and Mr. Ross. Well, let's have them. They're both group O. I see. Miss Mason, Mr. Ross, some skin was found under the fingernail of the dead girl, which Dr. Lampton tells me was Group O. You are both Group O. Anything to say to that? So what? Doesn't mean a thing. Of course not. I don't know much about science, but at least I know that Group O is by far the most common one. Nevertheless, I have to ask you both to allow Dr. Lampton to examine you to see if you have any fingernail injuries... Seems highly likely that the unfortunate Miss Simpson managed to mark her attacker slightly. I've had enough of these innuendos. I'm going to call my solicitor. I'm sick to death. Ellis, see you, Tazewell. Yes, sir. Oh, is this the lab for you, Dr. Lampton? Oh, right. I'll take it here. Thanks. Excuse me. Right. Hello? Yes? Yes? Are you absolutely sure? I see. Thanks. Yes. Thanks very much. Well, Superintendent, that was the extra information I was hoping for. And the identity of the attacker seems obvious now, I'm afraid. Uh, just a minute, Doctor. I think we should all hear what you have to say. Uh, everyone, I want you to hear what Dr. Lampton has to say. Uh, that fragment of skin under the dead girl's fingernail, well, my assistant has just been examining it under the microscope, and it shows certain characteristics that together with the blood group, virtually put the finger on the killer. What's all this mumbo-jumbo? We don't want a lecture on biology. I want my solicitor. Mr. Ross, please. Now, Doctor, tell us what you mean. 
the body cells of certain people have an extra blob of chromosome material in their nuclei. Well, it can be seen especially well in blood cell and skin cells. This skin fragment had the extra blob without any doubt. Damned hocus-pocus. Certain people, you mean racial, like Italians as opposed to... Oh, no, 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 superintendent, not racial, but sexual. Men don't have it, but women do. And this woman also had blood group O. <laughs> Stop her! Yes, sir! Don't get it! Don't make it for the stairs! Catch her! Come on! God! She, she, she's fallen down the stairs! Like a brick! Let him below! How is she? The cushion. A couple of cracked ribs. She'll be well enough to stand trial for murder. I still can't believe it. Lena, the one who killed poor little Paula. Oh, it's horrible. Yes. I suppose this means that she was the one who sent me that letter. And the telegram. She made a full confession to Ellis in the hospital. But how did she get to know about Francini? Well, through her work here, she came across a photograph in a Rome newspaper. It showed one of his old meetings. And in the background, there were you, Miss Osborne, as clear as day. She checked up on the dates. She found out that you were there at the time. Yes, but why blackmail her? Mm. Well, first, for money. She was living above her means, of course. That's true. Mm. And uh, you, Miss Osborne, were loaded, as she put it. Or your parents were. What was the other reason? Well, if she couldn't manage direct blackmail for money, she wanted to put you out of the running for this senior job. It is almost double the salary, I understand. Yes, yes perfectly true. Well, she was next in line by virtue of her qualifications. But if she tipped off the security people about Fancini, the job would have been in the bag. Yes, but why kill poor Paula? What had she got to do with the whole affair? Well, Lena Mason was in the ladies' cloakroom in the afternoon trimming a broken nail or something with the office scissors. Miss Simpson came through and accidentally knocked over Miss Mason's handbag. All the stuff fell out and Miss Simpson hurried to pick it up. She saw the sheet with the capital letters cut out and immediately realised who sent the Francini letter. Oh, knowing our straight-talking Paula, she would have made no bones about accusing Lena on the spot. Oh, exactly. She, mm. she said she was going at once to tell you, Miss Osborne, and the security people to expose her. Oh, Lena Mason alleges she can't remember what happened next. She found herself standing over the dying girl with a bloodstained pair of scissors in her hand. Well, she had a hell of a temper. Lena's rages were a notable feature of life in this office, eh, Mr. Evans? Yes, I'm afraid so. But what about the telegram I had? What was the idea of that? Well, oh, when she saw what she'd done, she realised she had to divert suspicion onto someone else. She found your shoes in your locker, flicked blood on them, and then dropped the pair of scissors into the lavatory cistern and bundled the body into the locker after putting the magazine in the dead girl's handbag. Mm -hmm. But the telegram... Well, now then. You had gone home, hadn't you? Long before Miss Mason was missing. Yes, I had. So if you were to lose your alibi, she had to get you back to the office to make you a suspect. Well, uh, now, she sent a telegram from a public call box so it couldn't be traced. Then you could equally well have sent it to yourself, you see. So no phone call was ever intended last no, night? No, exactly. It was just to get you up here long enough to have killed the dead girl. Well, that's clever. Yes. And Miss Mason guessed right that if the body wasn't found until today, doctors couldn't be sure whether the death had occurred in the afternoon or in the evening. I must say, the coolness of it all. But what about the fall in the foyer? Was all that part of the act? <laughs> yes. She told us about that as well. Oh. She had a little scratch, apparently, in the back of her hand from the dead girl. Well, to cover up... She arranged a fall in full view of everyone and made sure she had a bad graze in the same place to obliterate the original scratch. Well, that was it. Well, Lena was clever. We all knew that. Mm -hmm. Too clever. She had years to think over where she went wrong, I'm afraid. We're handing over to the CID now that there's obviously no security angle involved. Oh, but there is a security angle, Superintendent. Mine. Mm -hmm. oh, I suppose I needn't waste time going to that interview next week. I'm finished in this place. I have to resign gracefully to save being given the sack. No, I wouldn't be too hasty, Miss Osborne. By all accounts, you're a first-class operative, isn't she, Mr. Evans? Oh, she certainly is, yes, And indeed. now, tragically, both your rivals for the job seem to have vanished from the scene. And uh, I'm not up for it, Jean. I was only pulling your leg when I hinted that I was. Uh, can't you have a word with the security staff, Superintendent? You must know them all, being in special work. Yes, well, I was just going to suggest that, Mr. Evans. I'll see what I can do, Miss Osborne. 
You've had rather more than your fair share of punishment for that rather trivial little deception about Mr. Fancini. Please don't mention that name, Superintendent. It'll be staring at me in capital letters from every page of every woman's magazine I read for the rest of my life. (laughs) Murder in Capitals was written by Bernard Picton. Elizabeth Morgan played Lena Mason, Louise Jarvis, Jean Osborne, Mavanwi Talog, Paula Simpson, Dilwyn Owen, Howell Evans, and Douglas Blackwell, Gabriel Ross. Other parts were played by David Lynn, Clive Roberts, Hubert Tucker, and Ray Handy. The play was produced in Wales by Lorraine Davis. Death of a Hooligan The two policemen who work together in Scotland find South Hants to be very different territory. But football fans tend to be the same the world over. Coleman and Astor by Michael McStay With Stephen Thorne as Inspector Ronald Coleman and Joe Dunlop as Sergeant Fred Astor. Death of a Hooligan. still here. Where have you been? Yes, all right, but I've been hanging on here for ten minutes. Well, is she there or not? Oh, come on, it's not the biggest nick in the world, is it? Come. Oh, are you busy, sir? Yes, I am. I'm trying to organise a sex life for myself. Oh, difficult at your age. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> Look, I've got somebody in my office. Will you just tell Constable Pegram to call me when she gets in? That's right. Sergeant Astor at South Hants Central CID. Oh, God. I don't know how some of these kids make it into the force. Most of them be hard put to catch a cold, let alone a real villain. Now, maybe this is the wrong time, Sergeant. No, no, that's all right. What can I do for you? Perhaps when your sex life is better? Watch it, Terry. I'm on a short fuse on a day like today, and, I, and I'm very busy. Well, I was wondering if I might get away a bit early tonight. Terry, it's Saturday night. Well, you know what they say, if you don't ask, you don't care. Not only is it Saturday night, it's semi-final day up in London, and Southampton are playing Manchester United. I know that. Sometime after nine o'clock, a crazed mob of supporters is going to take this city by storm. If the lads have won, the celebrations will be awesome to behold. And if they've lost, the grief will be orgiastic in its frenzy. Either way, every available cop is going to have to be out there on the streets. I'm only doing the death. And we'll need teams of bobbies armed with pens just to book them in. It was just that I had the chance to get out on the cars tonight, and I wanted to Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, Terry, but there'll be other times. You've only been back a few weeks. Look, get settled in first, then I'll do what I can to push you towards CID, eh? The cars are not CID. It's all experience, though, sir. Ah, you'll get all the experience you can handle tonight. Bloody area, old 
bloody git. Pass us a bottle, Benny. Hey, shut up. Just watch your bloody game for a minute. I can't. I can't bloody watch. Pass us a bottle. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Um, they just scored, Sarge. Who did? They did. Uh, we did. Uh, oh, are you talking about the football? Yes, Southampton. We just scored. How long have you been a Southampton supporter? I'm not. Well, but you have to show an interest in local affairs. Oh, well, for me, Celtic's local. My only interest down here is who gets to clear up the mess. How do you mean, Sarge? The psychology of the football hooligan, Terry. If their team loses, they get drunk in London, smash up the pubs up there and sleep it off on the way home. Less problems for us. But if they win, they get drunk all the way home and smash up the pubs here in Southampton. More problems for us. So, oh, well, it doesn't sound too good then, Sarge. Hmm? That was Southampton's third. Three one up and only a few minutes to go. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, mind. Hey, get him in again, Tonto. Oh, no, oh, come on, lads. Drink up. We can't get the train, Benny. Oh, bugger the train. I'll get us the car. Come on. <laughs> Whose shout is it? You get him in. Yeah. Bloody Northern gets. Did you see it? Free one. Oh, did you see our Dougie? Dougie, Dougie, golden boot. Dougie, Dougie, golden boot. Dougie, Dougie, golden boot. Hey, Governor, Dougie, do Dougie, these again, will you? Four points of that nuts water you got there. <laughs> Just keep it down, will you? Did you see it? Did you see our Dougie? Ah, oh, two bloody goals, they yeah, jackal. Two goals, one with his head. Oh, and yeah, yeah, one with his head. Dougie, Dougie, golden head. Dougie, Dougie, golden head. Hold on, uh, hold on. Yeah. Who are you talking to? I'm talking to you. Uh, just everybody take it easy. You shut it, bloody Northerners. I'll do to your, we did to your bloody football oh, team. Take it easy, Benny, take it easy. There's a lot of them. Yeah, nobody tells me. Now, look, I don't want any trouble, but if I do, the law will be here in two minutes. Now, you've got your drinks, drink them up and clear off. Oh, are you telling me? Come on, Benny, we got a train. I'm just asking you to keep it down. Yeah. It's lucky for you I got a train to catch. Yeah. Come on, Benny. Yeah. Come on, lads. Master. Yes. Yes. Oh, she leaves her front door open. What does she expect? No, don't tell her that. Um, I see. In and out in five minutes, no trace. So, what do you want me to do? I haven't got anybody. Saturday night. <laughs> Send a car. Well, that's your problem. We're all a wee bit stretched. <laughs> You, you know what to do. Take the details, make the right noises and get back here. And, and tell her to lock her blasted door in future. Damn, I give up. Never give up, Fred. A man's got a dream. It comes with the territory. What? Frederick March, dead of a salesman. I don't believe it. Of all the police stations in all the world. You had to walk into mine. Humphrey Bogart, I know that one. <laughs> but what... Inspector Coleman, what are you... God, it's great to see you, sir. It's wonderful to see you, Fred. But I'm as surprised as you are. What are you doing here? You're a long way from home. Well, I could say the same for you. But I work here. This is fantastic. It's good to see you. But what are you doing miles from home in the nick on a Saturday night? Not trouble, I hope. No, I was just uh, passing through, as they say. Oh, really? On the way from Scotland? No, no, no. I've moved down south. Oh, no. But you loved it up there. What happened? Oh, long story, Fred. What are you doing here tonight? Oh, a bit of business. Anyway, I saw the back of your head and I thought I'd know the back of that head <laughs> anywhere. You just wandered in. Who was on the desk? Nobody. Good God, you could have been anybody. Excuse me. Asta? Yeah? Oh, OK. How old? Yes. No, 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 don't do that. I'll come down. Okay. Busy? Oh, you wouldn't believe it, sir. Oh, that was uh, just some 14-year-old girl caught nicking a couple of jumpers. <laughs> I'll have a word, frighten her a bit and send her on her way home, eh? <laughs> uh, look, do you have time for the one? Well, 
If you're twisting my arm, Fred... There's a pub just across the road. There always is. Look, if there's anybody on the desk, ask them to direct you to the flag. I'll sort this kid out and join you there. Right, I'll get them in. You drinking the same? Hey, grouse if you're buying. Better still. I'll come with you. Uh, Fred Astor, I have a Mr... Uh, Inspector Coleman with me. Makes it sound more formal. <laughs> um, we're going to the flag for half an hour. Well, uh, hold on to that girl. Uh, dry her eyes and give her a cup of tea. Oh, and if a constable Pegram phones, I want to know. Well, tell her to stay where she is and I'll call her back directly. We'll slip out the back way. Look, if you're too busy, Constable Pegram? Oh, no, no, she's pleasure. Listen, I'm in charge here tonight. Well, in that case, I wouldn't want to drag you oh, away. Oh, no, from... no, 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 they can't start the war without me. We can talk better over a jar. Ah, look, there's no worries. I've got everything under control. Anyway, I need a break while it's still quiet. This town's going to blow apart in a couple of hours' time. you open his bloody door? No, I'm all right. I'm all right. He's got to sit down. Sack him must be down that way. All right. Come on, lads. <laughs> Here you are. This'll do. Oh, this is for a sharp. Here, what's wrong with you? There'll be room in Sack. There's room here. I'm sure this gentleman doesn't mind if we join him. <laughs> There'll be room in seconds. Uh, are these seats taken by any chance? <laughs> by any chance? Hey, I'm talking to you. I'm bloody talking to you. I said, are these seats taken? I don't believe so. <laughs> you don't believe so? Did you hear that, Tonto? He doesn't believe so. Oh, he doesn't believe so, eh? Did you hear that, Peter? Listen, let's go down set. Ah, oh, shut up. <laughs> hey, don't bother about him. It'll be better with a drink inside him. Hey, hey, I'm talking to you again. Would you mind if we joined you? It really is none of my business. You're too bloody right, it's not. Hey, get your bloody feet off the seats, Jacko. This is first class. <laughs> you can't take him anywhere, bloody hooligan. <laughs> Have you been to the match? <laughs> no. Ah, oh, he should have been there. Bloody slaughtered him. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you like football? It really is a matter of complete indifference uh, to me. What's that mean? Do you like it or don't you? Look, would you mind if we didn't talk? <laughs> I've had a long day and I would like to get through these papers. What papers are they then? They're professional papers. <laughs> professional? <laughs> Why? What do you do then? Well, if it's any concern of yours, I'm a doctor. <laughs> oh, I've been attending a conference in London. I would like to concentrate on these papers before getting an hour's sleep. I'll leave you, though. <laughs> yeah, let's get down the bar before they shut it. Hey, not for me. Give us a minute. I'm knackered. Oh, had enough of you. Who, oh, me, Benjamin, the torn terror? I'm just getting a second wind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? What do you want? Hey? Hey? I'm talking to you again. Do you know when I'm talking to you? Excuse me. Where do you think you're going? I'll find another carriage. You will not. You just tell me what you were looking at me like that for just now. Nothing, no. Nothing at all. I thought I... Yeah, knew. what did you think? I thought for a moment I knew you. I, I thought perhaps you'd been a patient. I've never been sick a day in my life. Obviously not. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me. I shall be very offended if you leave. I shall think it's something I said. I Just say. sit down, Doctor. And that's about it. I put as much distance as I could between Carrie and myself. Should have done it earlier. But we were a good team. What? Coleman and Astor? We put the fear of God into a few salmon poachers. Uh, it's a bit different down here. Wouldn't suit you, sir. Oh? Ah, I've always seen you as... Well... A gentleman copper. But, uh, like I say, I enjoy it. Keeps you off the street. <laughs> yeah. Being an inspector under strength, the workload's been heavier than it should, but once we get a new man, it should be a lot better. I wouldn't bank on that, Fred. How do you mean, sir? Well, 
might get another of those um, gentleman cops. <laughs> Don't know, sir. Not in South Hans Central. If you were a gentleman copper, you'd have to learn very fast to go under. Really? You didn't think to go for the job yourself? Oh, no, I'm not the type. I'm not officer material. Mind you, I'm enjoying running the shop at the moment, while it lasts. Ah, you don't think you ought to be, um, hmm? well, Saturday night? Ah, time for another. Saturday night doesn't start till the football special gets back, and that's not for another half hour. Anyway, you know what they say, when the cat's away... No doubt, be buzzing around like a blue ass fly once the new man gets here. No doubt. But I'll worry about that when it happens. So what about you? What do you mean you've moved down south? Have you uh, got a job down here? Yes. Because uh, the last time you and I met, uh, how did that uh, Kelso business sort itself out? Well, you prevented me making a complete fool of myself there. Eh? No, oh, I was. Anyway. Margaret and I discussed things at great length and eventually I decided to withdraw my resignation. You mean, uh... I mean, I'm still a copper. Oh, that's great news. Well, I certainly call for another one. Janice, these again, will you? However, there were conditions. I'm really pleased. Ah, you're too good a copper. Well, uh, you know what I mean. I'm glad you think so, Fred. The powers above were not so sure. They decided that after my little faux pas, it would be better for all concerned if I left Kirkaudry. They found me another job. Where? A city, Fred. Mm. You know how I hate cities. It, not to this part of the world. Yes. Where? Not... <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, you just said you were an inspector under strength. Not anymore. Hey, tickets, tickets. He's got the tickets. No, I haven't got the tickets. Have you got the tickets? <laughs> tickets, me. I haven't got the tickets. Have you got the tickets? Hey, Peter, wake up. Hey, hey wake him up. Hey, wake up, you dozy get. What? He <laughs> man wanted the tickets, man. You've demanded the tickets. Oh, yeah, I've got mine. Yeah. Your tickets, sir. Oh, Thank you, sir. Uh, what time do we arrive? Uh, yeah, no. 70 minutes past 10. Sir. Well, give the man the tickets. <laughs> This ticket is not valid for this train. This is a special excursion ticket. The ticket's for bloody what? Southampton. Yeah, it's for the special excursion oh, train. Yeah, but we missed this special excursion train, didn't we? Yeah, there weren't no room. Well, you have to pay excess fare then. Oh, oh God, Alex. And it is a second-class ticket. Yeah. So bloody what? This is a first-class compartment. As far as you are concerned, I am first-class boy. <laughs> Look, there really is no need to be so abusive. Whatever your name is. Yeah, take it easy. I say boy. That I can travel on this train any bloody where I like. Yeah, come on, Ben. Can you stop the train? No, I don't think I can. Get the police. Oh, police. Oh, I got you marked down. You, whatever your name is. Look, I don't want any trouble. Look, you, all of you, get out of here, or I shall insist this gentleman contact the police. Oh, you found your mouth all of a sudden. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Let's get a drink. There are seats available. I don't give a monkeys. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to him. You. What's your name? Come on, Benny. Come on. Just take your bloody hands off Come me. Come on, I'll get him in. All right, all right, just take your bloody hands off me. You, whatever your name is, I got you marked. I'm not going to forget you. Come on, Benny, leave him. You don't want to waste your time on people like this. Come on. I'm bloody gasping for a Benny. <laughs> hey, hey, it were a non-smoker anyway. <laughs> Benjamin. What's that? You, uh... Benny Benjamin? That's it. That's me. Benny Benjamin, the Totten Terror. You remember that? Because I'm not going to forget you. I've got you marked. I'm going to remember your face. Come on, lads. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll contact Southampton. I'll get the police to meet them. Yes. Yes. Benny Benjamin. Oh, my God. What I mean is, sir, You'll get used to it. You don't believe that, do you, Fred? You think I'm going to hate it. What did you call me? A gentleman copper? I, I didn't mean that... Oh, I expect you're right. I always wanted to be Humphrey Bogart. Sham Spade. But I'm afraid I'm more of a Nick Charles. Who's he, sir? The thin man, William Powell. You are hopeless, Fred. Uh, sorry, sir. But I'll have to learn, as you said. Well, there's not a lot of room for the... Uh... The amateur detective? Ach, it's not for me to say. You're quite right. Be positive. 
That's what Margaret said. And if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. Ah, did Mrs Coleman say that? No, I Sarge. said that. Uh. Sarge! <clears throat> Fred, there is a half-dressed constable at the door trying to attract your attention. Oh, damn, I should be going. Sarge, telephone! Oh, uh, right, uh, would you excuse me, sir? That's uh, probably... Yes, 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 of course. I'll be across in a moment. Oh. Fred? Yeah? Who was that? Oh, that's uh, Terry Trench, PC Trench, sir. He wasn't wearing a hat. Oh, no, sir, he just popped across the road. He should be wearing a hat. Well, he was on the desk. And... Have a word, Fred. Let's be positive. Yes, sir. It's called the blue arsed fly syndrome, Fred. Hey, you! Do these again, will you? I'm out of bloody cash! You're out of bloody old. You are. <laughs> hey, you, barman! I'm talking to you. Get these in again, will you? Which way's the bog? I think you gentlemen have had enough. You what? I think you've had enough. <laughs> Who's he calling gentlemen? I'll be the judge of that. Do you hear that? He says I'm drunk. Do I look drunk to you? <laughs> rat <laughs> Hey, you! I've had about enough of you and everybody on this bloody train. Now, put them up again, or I'll be over there and help myself. Right! This bar is now shut. I am shutting the bar. You shut the bar and I'll shut you for good. This is a staff announcement. Will the guard please come to the forward buffet car? I warned you. No, Benny, 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 just wait a minute. Look, he doesn't mean that. I'll tell you what we do, right? We put our money on the bar, yeah. see how much we got, then we can buy as much whiskey as we no, can. I'm and then skin. Oh, come on, you're no, just shut up, shut up, right? Yeah. Then we'll buy all his whiskey, right? then we, we can shut his friggin' bar. The bar is closed. I bloody Dad, warned you. I'm going to get you. Hey, you. Benny? <laughs> is he all right? Benny? Is he? He's all right, isn't he? He's not. Oh, don't be so stupid, Tano. He, he, he's just in his head. He looks terrible. <laughs> this is a staff announcement. Will the guard please come to the forward buffet urgently? <laughs> Benny? <laughs> she was there, Sarge. Well, she's not there now, is she? Listen, I asked her to hang on. You asked her to hang on, then you went over to the flag to find me. Oh, come on, Terry, that's ten minutes. Do you expect her to hang on for ten minutes? I don't know. If it was important. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Oh, butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, would it, Terry? Well, things are going to change around here. We're finally getting that new inspector. He's arrived. Oh, is that Inspector Coleman? Yes. How did you know? It was posted on the notice board a couple of days back. You didn't tell me. I thought you'd have read the notice board. Hello, Cathy. Look, Look, I'm not in the mood, Vic. I read it every day. Eh? No, 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 I heard you, Vic. The notice board, I read it every day. But would you just shut up a moment? No, 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 not you, Vic. There's a lot of noise. Yeah, yes, yes, we are busy. Good evening. Yes? Did you want something? No, no. Inspector Cole. Stay at the hospital Uh, until you've got something um, definite. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. You've got Uh, the drive. Constable Trench. Welcome to Southampton Central. Thank you. How old? Um, I understood you weren't starting until Monday, sir. Well, I was in town. Well, I thought I might you know take what the to opportunity do, to uh, spy out the land. Yeah. Oh, well. Then get back as Very soon as you can. I need everybody. Constable Trench, uh, I have walked through the front door of this police station twice tonight and there's been nobody on the desk to stop me. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, you better get back there, Terry. Uh, right, Sarge. It'll soon be getting busy. Uh, Saturday night. Nice to have met you, sir. <clears throat> That was my fault, sir. Not the point, Fred. He's a good lad. I'm sure he is. He's uh, one of the new breed. Ah, there's a lot of them about. Straight out of university and on the fast track to Brands Hill and full of himself. Got his nose into everything and everybody over 30 is dead. He could be right. Oh, no doubts about what's right and what's wrong. He's got a computer to tell him what he needs to know. Well, he'd do well to start by knowing that when he's on the desk, he's on the desk. Just keep him in line, Fred. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, Terry. Yes, I know she's still waiting. Yeah, give her another coffee. He's a bit too cocky. But make no mistake, sir, that lad knows where he's going and how long it's going to take. Sounds as if he's after your job. Oh, no, sir. He's after yours. Uh, I promise, I never touched him. The next time he's got his Winchester. He just fell. I could get help. He's not going to last. Look at him, for God's sake. I'm going to be sick. Well, there's nothing else I can do. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I've never seen anybody... He was climbing across the bar. Oh, shut up whining, will you? He's going to die. You shut up, Tom. We need the heads. Break off, Peter. Uh, 
There's a doctor. Well, I could make an announcement. That, that bloody bloke back there, he said he was a doctor. Who? In the carriage, the guy we were with. Well, go and fetch him. No, I can't. He ain't going to come with me, is oh, he? Look, I'll go. Then he's going to snuff it, else. I'll go. Harry, huh? you put out an announcement. All right. I'll go and find him, all right? Hurry up, <clears throat> for God's sake. If there is a doctor on board the train, will he please come to the buffet in the front portion of the train as soon as possible? Right, uh, well, oh, yes. uh, Asta? Josie, yes. Well, what the hell are you doing there? I don't give a damn. I'm short of bloody personnel, too. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shout, but anybody can handle a few smashed windscreens. It's probably some idiots off the first train, and they're the ones that haven't had a drink. Look, I can't have a car... <sighs> look at me. Yeah, all, all, all right, Josie. Yes, knock on a few doors and ask if anybody saw or heard anything. Yes, you know the form, but don't waste any damn time on it. Get back here. I have a trainload of real maniacs arriving at ten o'clock, and when they do, I want a very obvious police presence. I'm sorry, Fred, but I didn't even know my way back to the front desk. <laughs> ah, I know, sir. Oh, with leave and sickness, I sometimes think I'm the only one looking after the shop. And I still haven't seen that kid downstairs. No, I, I didn't touch him, Doctor. He was very drunk. How drunk? We did a few bevies. Well, how many? Who was counting? Well, he can hold it. Yeah. Your friend is having a heart attack and all you can do is brag about his capacity to hold his drink. No. How many? I don't know. How many? Well, they must have had five, six. Oh, good God, that's enough to... And before that, you'd been drinking before you got on the train. We'd been drinking yeah. all day. All day? Well, on the train down. It was the match. He was trying to climb over the bar. What do you want to do, Doctor? Well, he's probably dying from alcoholic poisoning. Oh, God! Oh, I'm getting the bloody bar. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look, he might not be dying. He, he can handle it. Yeah, he can handle it, eh, Jacko? Yeah. Doctor... Pass me my bag. I want this train stopped. Well, we've just gone through Basingstoke. Uh, Winchester's the next stop. Uh, Winchester. Well, what are you oh, going to do? Well, I'm going to give your friend an injection. Thank Try you. to reduce the pressure. Well, is there anything I can do? Yes, uh, get them out of the way. Over there. I, I need space. Yes, sir. Well, come along, gentlemen. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you too, if you'd be so kind. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, then you stop the train at Winchester. Have an ambulance standing by. You'll have to pump his stomach. If he lives that long. Look, you're all right. Do you understand? Yes. You're in the police station. You'll be charged later. I... But for now, I'm going to send you with this officer oh. to find you a cell for the night oh. till you've slept it off. Do you understand? I... And if we find your trousers, we'll give them to you. Oh, God. Um, Southampton Central. Uh, Look, Phil, could you get him a coffee? See if you can find him some uh, spare trousers. Yeah, right. Sir. Come on. Uh, sir. Sorry. Ball. Say again. Uh, I'm in the interview room, oh my Jerry. Oh God. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, look, hold on a second, will you? Sarge! Sarge Nassar! I'm not here, Terry. Handle it yourself. But, but I think it's urgent. Terry, I've got to talk to that young girl. What do you mean you think it's urgent? There's a man died on the London train. Is he expecting a refund? Pardon, sir? Never mind. What's it to do with us? W would you speak to them, Sarge? I'll slip away quietly, Fred. I'm already looking forward to Monday morning. Sergeant Astor here. What's the problem? could do with a drink. You all right, Peter? No, I'm sick. Oh, th that will be the police. Ah, good evening. I'm Sergeant Astor. This them? Uh, yes, sir. Joseph Atterley? Oh, yes, sir. You? Henry Peterson. Uh -huh. I'm a steward. They beat Yeah, yeah, all right. I think I've got the basic facts. Where's the body? Uh, Winchester Hospital, sir. Where? In Winchester Hospital. I'm afraid the man was already dead, but uh, I thought a paramedic team... And who are you? Uh, Dr. Ian Kendrick. A doctor? Yes, I tried to administer... I've got an ambulance standing by here. The body's in Winchester. Oh, yes, sir. Why wasn't I told all this? You you put the body off in Winchester. Mm. <laughs> that ambulance has been waiting around here. It, it's needed. Tonight of all nights, it's needed. That's why the train was so late. Mm. Oh, yes, sir. Ta well, I made a very full report to the station manager, direct, sir. Oh, oh I'm sure you did. 
Well, there's been the usual breakdown of communication somewhere. Oh, how much longer have we got to stand yes. around here, right? What's your name? Jacko Jackson. <laughs> Will you pay good heed, Mr. Jacko Jackson? I'll keep you here just as long as it takes... You ta ain't got no right. Oh, I've got all no the rights right that take my fancy. You try me. Yeah. <sighs> Doctor, how did this man die? I've obviously not been told the full facts. The exact cause of death was a heart attack brought on by a fall after excessive drinking. A fall? I, I never touched him. He was trying to climb over the bar, you see. I tried to help, but there was little I could do. I wanted him into expert care as soon as possible, which is why he was put off at Winchester. But you said he was dead. To all intents and purposes, he was dead. Uh, but one clutches at any straw, and I'm also only a GP. It's always as well to cover one's own back in these situations. Relatives, you know. No, oh, don't tell me, Doctor. Right, well, that's really very little to be gained at this time of night. You'll all give your names and addresses to the constable here, and then you're free to go. Somebody will speak to you later. Uh, excuse me, sir. These people have not paid the correct fare. Well, well, you can sort that out. We've got bloody tickets. The tickets are not valid. And they was very abusive and threatening. What do you mean, <laughs> abusive? He doesn't even understand the bloody language. Look, <laughs> you'll go with this constable and this gentleman and you'll pay the full fare due. Oh, and if I get one word out of you, I'll hit you with everything I can think of. Oh, you. Have I made myself clear? Oh, I'm bloody terrified. <laughs> All right, constable. Start with behaviour liable to cause a breach of the peace. Oh, come on, Joe. Book him! Is there much in the paper, Ronnie? Hmm? You're looking particularly blank this morning. Am I? Sorry. No, there's not much news. Third cabinet reshuffle in four months. Saddam's nuclear threat. Bodies in freezer identified. That's the front page. What have you got? Um, pound slide continued... Oh, no, that's continued from page one. Quite a dull Sunday on the whole. Perhaps we should change our paper. I'm sorry, Margaret. You were fairly remote last night, and you haven't said a word this morning. You didn't sleep much last night, either. I hoped I hadn't disturbed you. Is it really that bad? Southampton Central. Yes, it is. Because it's the city. Because it's the city. But because it's the city, it's also the type of crime. I had a long chat with Fred Astor. Oh, you're going to enjoy working with him again. Well, there's nothing to say that we shall be working together. A lot will depend on Superintendent Beauchamp, pronounced Beecham. <laughs> and what's he like? Oh, I haven't met him yet. That's my Monday morning treat. Mm, he'll succumb to your charm. We all do. Yes. I don't think the local villains will, though. All cities are not the same. Angry. I always think that cities are angry. I quite like Southampton. Well, you go in and out and spend a fortune. Of course you like it. But there's an underlying viciousness in the cities. Casual violence. You dealt with three murders in Kakodri. Oh, but they were committed by people of some quality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've really settled in, haven't you? I've always loved the New Forest. Hmm. Too many trees. When Daddy sent me off to Bryanston School, I don't think he was prepared for me to become so attached to this part of the world. I miss the mountains. And I wouldn't have met you. There's no... no vistas. Only the other day I had news of somebody else we knew. Not even a decent pub in the area. John and Jan Morton. I told you. And they're all phony tourist traps. You haven't given the village a fair chance. Everybody commutes. I mean, it's just another London suburb. Oh, well, if you're determined to be a grouch. No, I'm not. I love to see you launching yourself into the village life, but it's difficult for coppers. I love the privacy of the old place. I know. It'll work out. I wish I had your confidence. You're such a gentleman. I love you, Ronnie. I didn't suppose you'd like to go back to bed. <laughs> no, I would not. <laughs> I love you, but you're a fool. And I'm going to church. Doesn't seem to be my day at all. But I will put in a word for you, with the Almighty. Mm. Oh, the uh, new inspector's just come in, Sarge. Uh -huh. Looks a bit lost. New boy. Won't take him long to find his feet, Terry. Then he'll have us all jumping around. Here, here's one for you. You've been to university, haven't you? Yeah. Ah, well. Have you, um, have you ever been in a bathroom and there's one thing there you can't see any use for? Is it a riddle? 
No, someone's nicked a lorry load of bidets. Now, what use would anybody have for 200 bidets? Ah, well, I'd check out the local YWCA's. Oh, yeah. Forgot about you sophisticated southerners. We were never bothered where I came from. Right, I'll give it to Fordyce. She can look into it. <laughs> well, is, uh, is that it then, Sarge? Yes, go on. Get back on the desk. Right, Sarge. Oh, uh, morning, sir. Good morning, Constable. <laughs> morning, Fred. Ah, oh, morning, sir. God, this place is like a rabbit warren. Where's Superintendent Beecham's office? I'd better make myself known. Oh, uh, next floor. Um, no, go, get, go back to the stairs. Mm -hmm. uh, turn left. Then the first... No, no, it's not. No, the first corridor, at least. Um... Oh, no, no, though you could go that way, it's, it's difficult. I think the best way is to go to the next floor and ask somebody there. I can see why they took you off traffic. What's he like? He? Yes, what's he like? Or is that information classified as well? I seem to have caught you on a bad morning. Oh, the superintendent. Oh, I think you're going to get on very well there, sir. Your kind of person. Really? Oh, relaxed, easygoing to a fault. Come on, Fred, we've known each other a long time. Would I lie to you, sir? Yes. I hope he's not one of those regimental sergeant major types. Oh, definitely not. Like, you make up your own mind, sir, but I think you'll be agreeably surprised. Uh, well, we'll see. If I ever find his office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have the feeling that's going to cost me a large malt. Come. Oh, good grief. Can I help you? I doubt it very much. I've been wandering through this maze for hours, searching for the Holy Grail. I beg your pardon? I'm trying to find Superintendent Beecham. I wouldn't have thought it was that difficult. Well, you've probably been here far longer than I have. What does it say on that door? It says Superintendent Beecham. Then who would you expect to find behind it? Uh, there's no need to be sarcastic, young lady. I'm not in the best of humours. I'm having a bad morning. Which doesn't look as if it's going to get much better. Do come in, Inspector Coleman, and shut the door. I take it you are Inspector Coleman. Yes, I... I am. Oh, good grief. That's right, Inspector. A single crown. It signifies Superintendent. Superintendent Beecham. Superintendent Barbara Beecham. Yes, I, I'm sorry, uh, Ma'am. I, I didn't realise. I, I wasn't expecting... Nobody warned me. Please, take a seat. I wish I hadn't given up cigarettes. I need something to calm my frayed edges. I don't permit smoking. No, I don't smoke. I, just... I have no wish to die as a result of somebody else's vices. The station is a smoke-free zone. It was one of the first changes I made when I arrived here. I think everybody accepted my reasons eventually. Yeah, I'm sure they did. There is an area set aside in the canteen. Yes, I was only trying to make light of... Would a coffee help you to relax? Too much caffeine. And it's too early for a large malt. Ah. Yes. Needless to say, I have spent some time studying your confidential file. You have read it yourself, I take it. Far too depressing. Hmm. I note that at Cacordry, you're in the habit of taking your lunch in, uh, the Prince Charlie. There's not a problem there, I hope. Not for me, ma'am. Because a word that crops up on more than one occasion is difficult. What does that mean, I wonder? Would you call yourself difficult? Not at all. I also note that you're given to intuitive thought and consequently acting on what is no better than a hunch. I don't like that. Well, it doesn't suit everybody, ma'am. We all have our own methods. I mean, Inspector, that I do not approve of my officers working in that fashion. I also see that on the most recent occasion you made a grave error of judgment which led to you offering your resignation. Is there any good news? Yes. Superintendent Macaulay did not accept it on the grounds that you were far too good an officer to be lost to the force. You have also had some spectacular results. That's a relief. I don't like spectacular results. I like results that are reached methodically, are watertight and regular. Sadly, the crime rate is increasing daily. But since my arrival here, our detection success rate has risen by 7%. And the conviction rate by 18%. I'm proud of that record. And I do not wish to see that progress hindered by any Lord Peter Whimsey inspirational methods of sleuthing. This is a tough area to police, Inspector. We're not playing Cluedo. I see. 
Um, may I speak freely, ma'am? Of course. If you've read my report carefully, you will also have noted that I've been a copper for a long time. Does it also say that I have considerable private means? I don't consider that relevant. It is to me, ma'am. I'm not in this job for the money, nor am I in it for the glory. It's in my family, it's in my blood. I suppose you might call me a dedicated copper. There's a lot of aspects of the job that I don't like, but somebody has to do it. I'm only interested in your methods, Inspector. Your motives are none. You said I could speak freely. Over the years, I've developed my own methods. They suit me. If they don't suit you, the remedy is in your hands. Ma'am. In the meantime, where I take my lunch or how I spend my free time is nobody's business but my own, unless it affects my professional life. To be brief, I am not accustomed to being treated like a naughty schoolboy. Forgive me. I was adding an adjective before the word difficult. Inspector. I'm sure that you are aware of all the reasons why morale is currently so low. None of us finds it easy to do our job. However, I suggest that you should try to come to terms with the... fussy females. Just as I have learned to live with overbearing males, with overt sexism. I've tolerated the patronising pat on the shoulder, and not only on the shoulder, from men determined to show their lack of prejudice by encouraging the little woman. I've lived with it, because I've always known exactly where I was going. However, I find now that amusement has sometimes been replaced by resentment, possibly because I am not prepared to allow anybody to take advantage of my sex. Nothing was further from my mind. You see, it's that kind of remark that... I was not attempting no. to... No, of course not. I apologise. That's my point. I'm aware that my experience has on occasion made me over-defensive. I suggest that you should try not to fall into the same trap. I'll try, Mum. Good. Inspector, I suppose that in view of your length of service and your appointment to a station of this size, you might have been expecting promotion. I had a long talk with Jock Macaulay. Then you're no doubt aware that in view of your past record, you're now to be considered as starting what can only be called a probationary period. I am also aware of that. Yes. It's not a situation that gives me any pleasure either. I suggest that we have both started off on the wrong foot. I shall lock this report away and form my own judgments. In the meantime... Welcome to Southampton Central. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, Inspector. Sergeant Astor. Yes, ma'am. You've worked successfully together in the past. Yes. Perhaps you'd like to renew that partnership. I like successful teams, Inspector. Thank you, ma'am. We both like that. Uh, by the way, ma'am, it's Ronald. Ronald Coleman? Yes, ma'am. I see. Thank you. I'll remember that, Inspector. Good grief. Ah, Dr Kendrick. Oh, do come in, Sergeant Astor. Uh, won't keep you, Mama. Thank you. Now, please take a seat. Ah... <sighs> Oh, what can I do for you? Oh, nothing serious, Doctor. Hope I'm not disrupting your morning. <laughs> oh, not at all. Monday morning, always busy. Uh -huh. And even more so after such a pleasant weekend. Most of them with backs after the first day in the garden <laughs> since winter. Look, I can come back here. Uh... No, it's not necessary. There's only Mrs Hill, who's a hypochondriac, oh. <laughs> and who will be much better after a prescription for some harmless analgesic, which is nothing more than a placebo. Uh, the other elderly lady is Mrs Patterson, who is lonely. She comes in every Monday for company. And the reassurance that somebody cares for. Hmm. Well, it's a very important aspect of the health service that politicians fail to comprehend. Well, I'm only here to thank you for what you did on Saturday no, night. No, no, not much, I'm afraid. 
If you could just uh, tell me again. Uh, oh, the youth. Uh, what was his name? Benjamin. Uh, yes, well, he had been drinking excessively, had fallen and hit his head. Who called you? They put out an emergency call, but in fact the guard fetched me. I had mentioned that I was a doctor. Uh, those youths had been behaving objectionably earlier. Well, stupidly. Mm. You know, drink. Mm. Well, he was in the process of having a heart attack. Uh, fortunately, I always carry my case with me. I'd actually been to London on a conference, so I injected glucogen to stimulate the liver to produce sugar. Unhappily, I was too late. And the rest you know. Yes. We haven't managed to trace any next of kin yet. He was living in a squat. There's a record of violence, theft. Well, I expect you know the type. Yeah. Uh, what about the others? Same story. I kept them in overnight, but it doesn't do any good. The no, cities are full of them. There'll be an inquest, of course. If you could make out a full report, I can see no reason why you should have to attend. Oh, I should be grateful. Not all my patients are Mrs Patterson. I'm sure not, Doctor. Anyway, many thanks again for your help. I'll see myself out. Uh, if there should be anything else, but uh, I really can't see that there will be. <laughs> oh, dear. Poor Ronnie. Don't you start patronising me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm genuinely concerned. You're so very much a man's man. A chauvinist. I most certainly am not. Well, perhaps I should say unliberated. You know what is man's work and what is woman's work. You're a little blinkered. Margaret, I just happen to believe that there are certain things that women do best. Like preparing meals and washing up and the ironing. You're sexist. I'm not. Tell me again about her ankles. Oh, that was a joke. I didn't see her ankles. <laughs> Mind you, she had very slim wrists, which often suggests trim ankles. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it, Ronnie. Just try to keep out of her way. <laughs> A fat chance of that. I'm directly responsible to her. But she had the good sense to keep you and Fred Astor together. Yes. And he owes me a large malt. Oh? Yeah, he set me up. He deliberately chose not to warn me about Superintendent Barbara. I walked into her office like a lamb to slaughter. <laughs> what are you smiling at? Nothing at all. How is Fred? Oh, he's fine. And uh, wh what was his wife's name? Carrie. Oh, no, that's long over. Well, I hope he finds somebody. A man needs a woman. No, who's being sexist? Actually, I think he's interested in a young policewoman locally. But he's not having much luck. Missed a date on Saturday thanks to some young Ted away getting himself killed on the way back from the soccer game. Oh, yes. I was going to tell you. It was in the local paper. The doctor's name was Kendrick. No, I don't know. He lives fairly locally. Everyone's been talking about it. Everyone? I met Julia Hathaway. Who's Julia Hathaway? Oh, you know who Julia Hathaway is. She's the chairperson for the Friends of the Village. She told me. Uh, about what's his name? Dr Kendrick. Fascinating. Well, it's interesting when it's somebody you know. Yeah, but you don't know him. Oh, stop nitpicking. Anyway, he was on the train. He tried to save the boy's life. Um, have I had time for another of these before... Oh, we... yes, yes. It's only a casserole. Apparently, he's had a tragic time with his daughter. Kendrick? What was that? Well, she was run down by one of those joyriders. Well, it's very sad. She was months in hospital. She was paralysed from the waist down, and I, I believe there was brain damage. And she was only a teenager. Yeah, this all looks completely straightforward, Terry. Everything here? Yes, Sarge. Steward, guard, and the three youths? I had to take those down myself. One of them couldn't write at all. All right, and here's Kendricks. Get them over to the coroner's office as soon as possible. All right. Okay. What is it, Terry? You're smirking. Uh, this has come in this morning. Report from the hospital in Winchester. Well, well. Alters everything, doesn't it, Sarge? Well, that alters everything, doesn't it, Fred? Certainly going to make things difficult for him. Poor man. Mm. The medical profession sticks together in cases like this. Oh, I wasn't thinking of that. He already has enough problems. Hmm? Margaret tells me he has a crippled daughter. Huh? Hit and run accident. Uh. Well, you'd better go and see him again, Fred. Rather you than me. You wouldn't, uh... uh... It's your problem, Fred. And I'm still trying to come to grips with this little lot. I mean, are these the crime figures for the entire Southeast, or just our little bit of it? I did warn you, sir. Well, God warned Noah, but I expect the extent of the flood still took him by surprise. That alters everything, doesn't it, Sarge? Very much so, Terry. 
wish you'd stop saying that. Oh, sorry, Sarge. Just thought I'd do some cross-checking. And it was all there on Benjamin's record. Yes, it was staring at me on Saturday night. Even when the inspector mentioned the daughter, still... We're all human, Sarge. I expect you'd have got there eventually. Oh, thanks for the vote of confidence, Terry. Now, get me everything you can find. The court case, the hospital, the lot. Hello, sir. Sergeant Astor. Something you ought to see. The Kendrick business. It alters everything. I didn't know who he was. He was a drunken lout who was in danger of dying as a result of his own excesses. And I had the misfortune to be on the spot. And I find that very difficult to believe, Doctor. Are you saying that you sat in court, gazing at the man who ran your daughter down, and 18 months later you failed to recognise him? Benjamin had long hair and a beard. The man on the train was a skinhead. And he died of an embolism caused by air being injected into the bloodstream. <laughs> if you say so, Inspector. Now, I don't say so, Doctor. The report from the hospital says so. You saw those men. Hooligans' filth. And the one, Benjamin, uh, the one who called himself Benny Benjamin, do you know what they gave him? Dr Kendrick... Six I'm months. Di- Six months for stealing a car when he was already banned from driving and hurtling drunk through the streets of Bournemouth until he hit my daughter. Six months he got for that, Inspector. I can understand. Oh, can you? Do you have children? Would you like to see my daughter? She spends her days sitting in a wheelchair. Her head... Her head hangs on her left shoulder. She dribbles constantly from that side of her mouth. My wife uh, devotes her day, her whole day, 24 hours, taking care of her, cleaning her, changing her, feeding her. And that bastard got six months. And he was on the train. They say that she can understand. I hope to God she can't. And this man, Benjamin, was on the train. I did not know it was him. You must see how it looks to us, sir. How it will look to a coroner. I did not know it was him. I found a man unconscious, having a heart attack, and I took the action that I considered appropriate. What would have happened if you had not given him the injection? (sighs) Well, there's a faint chance that he might have survived the attack unscathed. The almost certain probability is that given the fact that he was unconscious, already going into a coma, he would have suffered brain damage, which could have had a variety of possible effects. He could have ended up like my daughter. And the injection you gave him? It was a hypoglycemic. He should have recovered consciousness. But instead of that, air injected into the bloodstream... Well, I may have made a mistake... Given the circumstances under which I was working and given the urgency of the problem I was faced with, it is possible that I omitted to eject the air from the needle before injecting the patient. It is possible that under those conditions I made an error. A fatal error. Hmm. Well, at best I shall have to face a disciplinary inquiry. At the worst, I may have to face a charge of manslaughter. Except that the man you killed was the man who destroyed your daughter's life. My duty lies with a patient, no matter what my personal feelings may be. But I repeat, and will repeat on oath, that I did not know who he was. I will take my chances, Inspector. The way things stand, I'd say his chances are pretty good. Yes. Well... uh... There's not much else we can do, Fred. I'll contact the hospital. The hospital? What for? (laughs) You know me, sir, the routine, tidying up the loose ends. You know why, sir. Who the hell is going to worry? You, sir. Me. We have to know how much of that drug he used. Whether he used the drug, he said, we have to ask for a full post-mortem. <sighs> You're very quiet. Am I? Sorry. Are you not going to finish that? <sighs> no, I'm sorry. It was very nice. I just... 
I think perhaps I'll have another of these. Another one? Yes, another one. Good grief, you're starting to sound like Babs. Oh, Babs? Well, it's what the lads call her. Barbara Antoinette Beecham, superintendent. I'm sorry, Margaret. Oh, but it's been a bad day. Why don't you have your whiskey in the sitting room? You might save a bit of the fire. I'll put these things in the machine. Your Dr Kendrick is going to go down for murder. They did a post-mortem on the Benjamin man. There were no traces of drugs of any kind. Kendrick didn't take any chances. He just pumped air directly into his bloodstream. The poor man. How could he have thought to have got away with it? Well, perhaps... Perhaps he didn't think at all. You've always told me that most murders are committed in a few seconds of madness. <sighs> Who misses people like Benjamin, Margaret? The streets are cleaner places without them. Why don't you take your drink into the other room? We waste time and resources on these hooligans and to absolutely no avail. While people like Kendrick, who actually contribute something to... When I've done this, I'm going to bed. I'm listening to a book at bedtime. Hmm? Oh, is it any good? A bit dreary. You don't mean a word of that, Ronald. Things will look different in the morning. Hmm? <laughs> I'll see you in bed. Don't be long. I'd rather a dreary old policeman than a dreary old book any day. Death of a Hooligan in the Coleman and Astor series starred Stephen Thorne as Inspector Coleman and Joe Dunlop as Sergeant Astor. Margaret Coleman was played by Diana Bishop, Superintendent Beecham, Francis Jeter, and PC Trench, Nicholas Bolton. Dr. Kendrick, James Kerry, Benny Benjamin, Dominic Curtis, Adams, Tom Bevan, Jackson, Peter Kenny, Craddock, Paul Panting. Train guard, Hakim K. Kazim. Train barman, Gareth Armstrong. Pub landlord, James Taylor. Coleman and Astor is written by Michael McStay. Theme music by Stephen Warbeck. The series producer and director was Jane Morgan.